Order. Okay, Councilmember Jose Wezar, this is the Planning and Land Use Committee. I've been joined by Councilmember Price and Councilmember Blumenfield, who are here in, in the audio box in the back. They will come forward soon. And uh, first, if we could um, go to the multiple item speaker cards. That item or that section is for individuals wishing to speak on more than one item. And we afford them uh, two minutes to uh, speak on that item. There are no multiple item cards on that, so we will um, move on that item and go to our consent calendar. Item number two, we do have a number of speakers, so let's move to item number three, which we will continue to a date uncertain. Item number three, we will continue to a date uncertain. And if we could go back to item number, uh, let's go to um, item one, which is a report from the director of planning. Uh, no report, uh, Chair Weezer, but I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. Bertoni. We will receive and file item one with no objection. Let's go to item number two, please. If you could please call that to order, Mr. Mejia. Yes, Councilman. Item two is a draft uh, city attorney prepare ordinance relative to a development agreement between the city and Walter and Aisha Yeshing Family Trust. Okay, is staff here on this item to present? Can you please briefly present this item? Thank you. Good afternoon, members of the PUM Committee. This is Lucia Barra with the Major Projects Section for the Department of City Planning. Uh, what's before you is the draft ordinance um, and development agreement relative to the property at 1930 Wilshire between the city and the applicant. This is your second time considering the development agreement. The only change, the only two changes that were made um, since CPC's action on the development agreement was uh, the plain, uh, the payment to new economics for women, the um, amount has not changed in, in the amount of, uh, t I think it was like $2 million. Okay. Um, it was done in lieu of a full payment. It was done in payments um, over the course of the, uh, beginning with the 90 days of the effectuation of the development agreement and then in quarterly payments thereafter. The other change was that the additional affordable housing to be set aside in the project in excess of the density bonus units, the change for the uh, house, household income qualification was uh, modified from very low income and uh, to workforce housing. And that concludes planning's presentation. Great. Thank you very much. We have a number of public speakers. Gerald Gubaton from Council District 1. Tom Councilman Gilcidio's office. Our office urges the committee to approve the proposed ordinance, which is a development agreement with a robust set of community benefits, including a private contribution of $2 million toward a 60-unit affordable housing development that serves extremely low-income women who are survivors of domestic uh, violence, who are formerly homeless. And so we see this proposed development as a major catalytic investment in the neighborhood of MacArthur Park thank you for your consideration. Thank you very much. Alexandra Wyman, Carlos Sanabria, each person has one minute. Welcome. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alexandra Wayman. I'm a research analyst with Unite Here Local 11. We represent over 30,000 hospitality and food service workers in Los Angeles and Orange County and now Phoenix, Arizona. We wish to express our strong support for this project and the approval of the developer agreement. 
The developer has gone to great lengths to create a project that will include many community benefits for the city of Los Angeles and the Westlake community, including access to good jobs and local targeted hiring. We thank the developer for his partnership and council member Cedillo for his leadership on this project. We look forward to this project moving forward. Thank you. Thank you. Carlos Sanabria, Keshini W, Francisco Rivera. Mr. Chair, Salvador Sanabria, Executive Director of El Rescate, is a 37-year-old organization serving more than 38 different immigrant communities in the Pico Union Westlake area of MacArthur Park, and we are in full support for this project that will provide much needed jobs to our community as well as affordable housing. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, honorable chair of this committee and committee members, uh, my name is Francisco Rivera and I have been living in the Westlake community for the last 20 years and we are so happy that, that this project is happening in this area. It, it really is quite a development. You know, I made the observation the other day that since they established yeah. the Home Depot, you know, in the Starbucks, they, they, not much has happened in this area. So that is why I am in total support of this project. So please consider the approval. Thank you. Thank you. After, uh, your name is uh, Kishini? Kishini, yes. And then uh, Marcos Pacheco, Maggie Cervantes. Welcome. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Keisha Name Jaguna Ratna. I wish to express my gratitude for an admiration to Dr. Walter Jaisinger. It has been a pleasure and a blessing to have known him for over 30 years. He has been the father for the entire Sri Lankan community and many other communities in Los Angeles. Dr. J's dream has been to improve the neighborhood he has worked all his life. The project he has planned to rebuild the Westlake community looks very an advantage for many who live and work there. This is an outstanding accomplishment for the entire neighborhood as this area has not had any improvement for any de development at all. I wholeheartedly support this project and hope you will all support the project and fulfill Dr. J's dream to come true. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, my name is Maggie Cervantes and I am the Executive Director of New Economics for Women, the nonprofit operator of La Posada. New would like to go on record that we are comfortable with the payment structure proposed and appreciate the efforts of Dr. J to help La Posada keep its doors open and continue to provide affordable housing and services to previously homeless young mothers and women. Thank you. Thank you. Muy buenas tardes, señores miembros del Consejo. Ya todos sabemos... Un momento, por favor. Muy buenas tardes, señores miembros del Consejo. Good afternoon, members of the council. Ya todos sabemos lo grandioso y lo bueno, lo generoso que es el Dr. J. We all know how wonderful and generous is Dr. J. Estoy completamente de acuerdo con esta gran obra. I am totally in agreement with this magnificent um, work. Que, co que todos conjunto aquí. Everybody here. Vamos a hacer una obra histórica. We are going to make a historic. Uh, de embellecer. La ciudad angelical. We're going to beautify this city. Y dando lugar y morada a muchas mujeres, más de 400 con casas de bajos recursos. Uh, we're going to be giving housing to a lot of women, for more than 400 women here that we're going to provide them with housing. Es hora de aprobar esto. It's time for us to approve this. Y los felicito por tener gran 
So I, I thank you so much. Gran intención de aprobar esta obra. To have your good intention to approve this uh, um, great uh, public uh, que Dios, que Dios bendiga. God bless you. A nombre de toda la comunidad peruana. God bless you, the, the Peruvian community. Oh. <laughs> okay. Que Dios bendiga. God bless the Peruvian community. Porque yo como artista. Because I'm a como singer. Cantante, I'm a singer. Estoy contenta de tener un centro de artes escénicas. I'm very happy to have a, a theater somewhere that I can express myself. Señores padres de la patria, que Dios los bendiga. God bless you all. Thank you. Gracias. Luz del Sol, Daniel Morales. Luz del Sol just, just spoke, right? Okay. Daniel Morales, Alex Raymond, Francis Park. Good afternoon, Chairman Weiser and Honorable Council Members. I'm Francis Park from Park and Valios on behalf of the Lake on Wilshire Project. The matter before you today is simple, and I'll keep it very short. The development agreement which was unanimously adopted by this committee and city council in January this year, was referred back to CPC. Unfortunately, your changes were rejected by CPC. City process requires your final review. The two changes that you adopted previously are outlined in our letter that we submitted today. The changes help to preserve, in addition, uh, 60 units of extremely low-income housing, units that are at risk of closure, and allow the project to provide 39 very low income and 10 workforce housing units. These changes would allow the project to proceed without delay. The Lake on Pro Wilshire project has tremendous public benefits with no residential displacement, and we are extremely proud of the positive impact it will have in transforming the image of the Westlake MacArthur Park area. Thank you for your approval of this project in January, and thank you for your consideration again of this issue. Thank you. Luis Cabrales, and Maggie Cervantes spoke already, Ruth S. Bonza, no? Okay. So let's, uh, any discussion, any questions on this item by committee members? Any objections to moving this item forward? Objection. Objections? We'll uh, approve. The item. The, there's a city attorney ordinance councilman, so we'll approve that ordinance. We'll approve that ordinance. We'll approve the uh, city attorney ordinance. Thank you. Yeah. Item number four. Um, item four, councilman, is an appeal filed by Admi Kumar Shah and Akshar Global Investment uh, relative to the decision of director of planning to revoke the hotel use at 10721. South Broadway in CD8. Okay. Is the, um, okay, Pastor Williams, well, let's get a, uh, let's get a presentation from staff on this item. Staff here on this? committee members, Alita James, Associate Zoning Administrator for Planning. Just a quick overview of this um, application. On February 2nd of 2015, the Planning Department opened a nuisance abatement revocation case for the business operation known as the 108 Motel, located at 10721 South Broadway. In response to community allegations and the Los Angeles Police Department call and arrest reports for a time period of three years, um, which covered April of 2011 through June of 2014. There was documented evidence of criminal homicide, rape by force, prostitution, keeping a disorderly house, assault with a deadly weapon, battery, kidnapping, burglary, robbery, theft, vandalism, and noise disturbance. At the time of the public hearing, the motel property manager, Mr. Shaw, testified that the owner of the property, Mr. Solansky, who was his brother, resided in Houston. Also at the um, public hearing, Los Angeles Police Department testified 
and provided support document, documenting that the site had been problematic uh, since 2001 and was eventually referred to the Citywide Nuisance Abatement Program, otherwise known as CNAP. On March 25th of 2016, the zoning administrator issued a determination and thereby imposed 35 operating conditions. The applicant appealed to the city council, which was denied, and the actions or the, um, it was sustained, the um, director's um, determination was sustained, and the 35 operating conditions were imposed. As required by uh, one of the 35 operating conditions, the applicant was required to file a plan approval review or a compliance report. A public hearing was set July of 2017 to determine the effectiveness of this level of compliance with the conditions and also to determine whether the additional or more restrictive conditions were warranted or in this case, whether a discontinuance of the use. In addition, in attendance of the um, public hearing was the motel operator, his legal representation, officers of the Los Angeles Police Department and neighbors and other community stakeholders. A portion of the public hearing discussion included the condition compliance investigation report, field analysis and a site visit that was conducted by planning staff June 13th of 2017 and again on June 16th of 2017. This report concluded that of the 35 imposed conditions, the applicant was in full compliance with only 11. And just to highlight a couple of the six conditions that the applicant was uh, in, not in compliance, totally not in compliance. Um, one was the uh, motel manager was unaware of the operations, uh, the operational conditions that were listed on the subject property and his employees were also unaware. There was a condition that required that the motel keys uh, be stamped, do not duplicate. The key ring, which was presented at the time of the site visit, was labeled with a removable tag that said, do not duplicate. The applicant also has failed to reimburse the city for the costs that were, that was required to, um, for the, under the initial nuisance abatement action. And that cost was $26,680. The applicant also is in violation at that time of uh, order to comply from building and safety, whereby they uh, constructed a new office space, had open storage, electrical and plumbing permits were, were absent. There were 16 conditions of the 35 where the applicant was in partial compliance. One of the 16 was the um, the applicant was required to have a security guard on site 24 hours, and it was supposed to be a license, a state license security guard. The guard card was expired at the time of um, the site visit. Upon careful review of the public testimony and documented evidence of continued nuisance activities at the site, a determination requiring the discontinuance of the use of a motel supported by written findings was prepared. As outlined in the administrative nuisance abatement proceedings under LA Municipal Code section 12.271C2, the director of planning may discontinue or revoke a land use or discretionary zoning approval only upon making the following findings. One is that prior governmental efforts to cause the owner operator to eliminate the problem associated with the land use or discretionary zoning approval have failed, in which case that did occur, for example, there were uh, formal actions such as citations that were issued by Building and Safety and orders by, issued by the Los Angeles Police Department that the applicant failed to comply with. The second finding is that the owner operator has failed to demonstrate to the satisfaction of the director the willingness or ability to eliminate the problems associated with the land use. In this case, both findings have been established. The operator was required to return within six months for a condition compliance review to show compliance or at minimum substantial compliance with the imposed conditions. Between the dates of the public hearing back in May of 2017 and the required compliance check in July of 2017, there has been nine additional LAPD notices to appear and complaint reports that were generated from this location. And again, there's still no valid state license guard card for the security 
and the, op the operator has failed to participate in the Southeast Area Neighborhood Watch meetings. Also, between a period of time of July of 2015 through July of 2017, there were 74 calls for service that were submitted for the property location, of which 33 of these calls occurred after the imposition of corrective conditions was issued. Between April of 2016 and July of 2017, there were 49 calls for service associated with the adjoining intersection of Broadway and 108th Street. Those included traffic, um, DUI, robberies, and vandalism. In summary, the operation of the motel has continued to adversely affect or impact the budding church and residential uses and directly affect the public health, peace, and safety as documented in the public testimony and written correspondence. There has been an insufficient attempt by the property owner and operator to take responsibility for the public nuisance originating from the location. In ex for example, only weeks prior to the public hearing, the operator agreed to offer housing services for the LA County in an attempt to improve the motel's reputation by offering urgently needed affordable housing services within the city. However, the history of allowing prostitution on the site raises great concern by allowing an unprotected population to uh, be located on the site. No constructive measures besides cosmetic measures to alleviate the public nuisance associated with the use of the site as a motel was proposed by the property owner or management. There continues to be no demonstrable effort to correct or address the violations of public nuisance at the location by the property owner or business management. Staff therefore request that the committee sustain the director of planning's decision for the discontinuance of the motel use and deny the appeal. Should there be any questions by the committee, staff is available for questions. Thank you very much. We'll um, move to public comment. Uh, Pastor Williams, Moises Rosales, and Detective Dana Harris. Good afternoon, Good afternoon. Chair Weiss and to this great council. I am Pastor Edwin L. Williams and I give leadership at the New Prospect Baptist Church at 109th and Broadway. Approximately 701 steps from this question piece of property. We offer in our community a haven of hope for our young people outreach program. And this, where the property is, is a, a hub for mischief and mayhem. I cannot tell you how many murders, how many robberies, how much mischief has gone on there. So we urge your consideration to exactly do away with licensing them to do business. Thank you very much. Hello, good afternoon. My name is Moisés Rosales. I am a resident of Century Palms. I'm also the Neighborhood Council President for the Southeast Neighborhood Council. I am here for uh, you guys to someday take a vote to actually tear down 108 motel. Uh, it's been a breeding hub for prostitution, uh, drug users. Um, ever since I was young, I grew up in Century Palms. I've seen that hotel, and it, it, it's time that it, it, it goes away from our community. It's about time. Thank you. Detective, welcome. Good afternoon. My name is Detective Dana Harris and I am a supervisor and officer in charge of the Los Angeles Police Department uh, Citywide Nuisance Abatement Unit. It's been my pleasure to serve the city of Los Angeles for the past 30, 30 years. When I first came to the abatement unit from the human trafficking unit, I happened to come upon the 108 Motel as a part of Officer Dickens, who's not with us today, uh, investigation. From the first time that I set foot on this property until the last time that I set up foot on this property, it was a constant source of nuisance. Before I came to that location uh, at one, the 108 Motel, I saw two young ladies who were obviously engaged in prostitution activities be solicited on Figueroa and then go directly to the 108 Motel, made contact with the business owner, and then had two rooms. This place is a general nuisance, so allow me to read what I have uh, prepared for you today. My responsibility uh, with the Citywide Nuisance abate Abatement Unit is to oversee the investigators assigned to DSVD. I ensure that the investigators form a partnership with both business and property owners within the community. Their job in primarily is to mitigate nuisance activity attributed to the business and or property, and most importantly, to be fair and impartial with the property and business owner. 
the 108 Motel has obviously been that problem property that the Detective Support and Vice Division has been so concerned about over the past several years. The current investigation has culminated in a comprehensive and, in, and an extensive investigation, not only involving the Los Angeles Police Department, Citywide Nu Nuisance Abatement Unit, the Southeast Area Vice Unit, Southeast Area Patrol Unit, Southeast Area Gang Detail, the Department of Building Safety, and of course, the City Planning and Zoning. This has been an ongoing investigation and an abatement. In that time, as I stated before, there have been numerous calls for service as I have here in my hand, which honestly over, overing over a thousand or too many to count over the past several years. I'm especially concerned not only about the calls, the calls for service, but the child abuse calls, the child neglect calls, the sexual assault, the robbery, the force, the fear, the crimes against persons, the domestic violence, the batteries, the disorderly house, the, the host of administrative citations that have occurred here as well, as well as not only by our department, but the Department of Building and Safety. Just in the past two and a half years, to give you a little bit more perspective, since I've been assigned to this unit, there have been over 100 calls for service and over 50 different stops that have occurred by officers at that motel. I have been to this established and witnessed my, for myself all times of the day and night, the steady stream of activity that has occurred. So I ask myself, why, why is this a hub for nuisance activity? Why is this a hub for criminal activity? Because it's being allowed to be committed on these premises. After each one of our arrests with the citywide nuisance abatement unit, especially with Officer Dickus, who's the primary officer at this location, and myself as well, after we make a detention and a stop and an arrest, the first thing that we do is we go to the business owner and the property owner. We ask him, do you understand the gravity of the situation? Do you understand that you have a disorderly house? Do you understand that this was a prostitute? Do you understand a robbery was committed at, this, at your property? In each case, we're told, yes, yes, I'm going to work on it. I'm going to work on it. And when I first came to this unit, two and a half years ago, I believe I was sitting right here. And now two and a half years later, the property owner is back and the business owner is back and saying that uh, he's constantly promising to fix his place up. He's constantly promising that he's going to be in the best business practices with the city of Los Angeles. In my 30 years, as I stated, it's a pleasure and it's a privilege to own and operate a business in the city of Los Angeles. I believe that this owner should have his use revoked because obviously he does not believe in the same business practices that we do here in the city of Los Angeles. I thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Mr. S. Dawson. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, and thank you to our officer, the planning, uh, the zoning administrator, and uh, Reverend Williams, and uh, our, our neighbor council president, um, Mr. Rosales. Uh, this uh, well-documented case is something that I think the city needs to move forth with on as we make budget considerations and try to figure out policing and all the resources that the city needs. It's just not fair that a business owner can break the rules over and over and over again. Um, drain the city's resources to help facilitate their, their business that's operating illegally and continue to uh, stay open. And so uh, we uh, ask for support of the uh, department's uh, recommendation in this regard and um, should note uh, that the appellant uh, did not uh, bother to even show up uh, to this hearing uh, this afternoon. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So with that, um, you're moving to uh, affirm the decision? So, so we'll deny the appeal, Councilman, and sustain the determination of the Director of Planning and also the oral and written finding. Okay. Motion has been made by Mr. S. Dawson. Any objections to that? Seeing none, so ordered. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Mr. S. Dawson. Okay, item number five, please. Uh, item five, Councilman, this is a city planning commission uh, proposed ordinance to regulate home sharing in the city and as well as the associated recommended uh, short-term rental enforcement, enforcement trust fund. Thank you, Mr. Mejia, and welcome everyone who's here on this item, this long-awaited item that we've heard now uh, at least four times in this committee. And I want to give some feedback on that. 
there feedback? No? Okay. Wanted to uh, welcome everyone and I hope we will be productive. Where is the audio person here? Yeah. Could someone else test their microphones? I think it's just this one that may have some feedback. Testing, testing, one, two, three. Three, two, one, testing, testing. Houston, we have liftoff. Thank you. So I hope we will have a productive meeting today. I want to start off by announcing that we will have one hour for public comment. It has been nearly three years since Council Member Bonin and Weston introduced a motion calling for the regulations of short-term rentals in the city of Los Angeles. And this, like I said, will be the fourth time that this committee hears the item. It's an understatement to say that this issue is complicated, but I feel the, that each time we met, we discussed the issue and heard from the public, we were able to make progress on finding a policy solution uh, that as more issues arose, we asked our staff to look into and they came back with more recommendations. The last time we were here, we asked our staff to look at possible solutions should we cap, how can people get relief from that cap if they are good operators. And so we have to proceed uh, cautiously as a city overall because it represents one of the largest housing markets. We've seen the evidence and there's no doubt that this issue is directly tied to the availability of housing in the city. Planning estimates that there are about 22,000 active short-term rentals at any given time, and of those, between six and 10,000 that are used permanently for short-term rentals, meaning that they are kept off the long-term rental market. While this represents less than 1% of the 1.4 million housing units in the city of Los Angeles, it is a threat to the housing affordability in the area. One of the key considerations we have grappled with from the very beginning is the issue of a citywide cap. It is important to recognize that without a citywide cap, many owners have an incentive to convert housing units from long-term to short-term use because there is a substantial financial gain to be made. It's already happening and will continue without a cap. Units intended to house a family on a regular basis may be lost to the short-term rental market and that undercuts our ability to literally live in the city. We talked about differentiating between hosted and non-hosted stays like other cities have done. Hosted guests are accompanied by the person who lives at that location for a true shared home experience. As a result, homes remain on the long-term market and hosted guests are less likely to impact neighbors' quality of life. Yet those same cities that we looked at admit that it's proven virtually impossible to verify if guests are accompanied by their host on a nightly basis. Therefore, this uh, represents, does not represent a viable policy solution. So as we discussed last time, uh, we asked our departments to explore a new concept, to provide a general framework that would allow hosts who are in good standing with the city to go above the cap. <laughs> My job as chair of the committee is to find consensus uh, and I, along with this committee, have listened and read comments, and I think it is fair that in a system that provides a cap, that those who are good hosts and operators, and maybe most importantly, good neighbors, be provided a mechanism that allows them to continue to operate in excess of the cap. Providing a review process that allows city oversight is the way we can build consensus around the issue. I think we need to be very careful, however, in how we craft this mechanism so that it is not a process that is too onerous or so costly that it is not accessible for good operators or otherwise who otherwise rely on this truly as a secondary source of income to subsist in the current housing market. But none of this would work without enforcement. We need to ensure permitting is as easy as possible for hosts. At the same time, we need to make sure enforcement is happening around the clock, including a 24-7 hotline for complaints real-time outreach to hosts, coordination between our various enforcement agencies, and relevant information about properties that is being shared by platforms. And so with that as background to explain how we got here and some thinking that has been going on on this issue, I'd like to ask our staff to present on the report that we last asked them
to report on when we heard this item back in February. So welcome to the planning department and if you could please give your report at this time. Thank you, Committee Chair Wizar, and good afternoon, Council Members. My name is Matt Gillespie with the Department of City Planning, um, and we're here to give our report back, our response to six uh, additional policy considerations this committee directed us to look at at the prior meeting on this topic on February 6th. Uh, we'll largely focus our remarks on the first two instructions, which, uh, as the Committee Chair mentioned, include a general framework that would allow qualified hosts to participate in home sharing above the citywide cap which we're calling extended home sharing, and additional options for neighbor sign-off as part of that process. In response to the discussion, we heard uh, from Plum Committee members last time on this topic in February, the department is presenting a two-tiered regulatory framework for hosts that would be eligible to exceed the cap. The two tiers include creation of an administrative clearance process and a discretionary review process with the basic idea that operators that have been shown to be operating responsibly could benefit from a streamlined ministerial process while hosts that have been the subject of nuisance violations and or complaints from neighbors would be subject to a more detailed discretionary process. Um, let me walk through some of the details on what that uh, framework would look like. So first, starting off with the administrative clearance process. Um, this is envisioned as a, again, a by right ministerial process similar to the way we're envisioning regular home sharing to work, where applicants would fill out an application form, hopefully online, and include the required documentation to register. However, when they select the extended home sharing option, two extra requirements could kick in. First, there would be a verification that the property is not the subject of an enforcement action, and the result of any, uh, the result of any nuisance violation as described in our code, um, particularly LAMC 1227-1B, which is our administrative nuisance abatement process, uh, which has a list of uh, what are considered nuisance violations. Uh, and that would be a check to make sure there's been no violations during the last three years before registering. Uh, examples of these nuisance violations include orders to comply from the Department of Building and Safety or the Housing and Community Investment Department, uh, for things like parking and front yard setbacks, uh, as well as uh, matters that the LA Police Department is responsible for enforcing, such as the noise ordinance, uh, criminal activity, littering, and those are often handled through what's called an administrative citation enforcement ticket, uh, or an ACE ticket. Um, so we would be looking at uh, records from the Police Department and other enforcement agencies the last three years, uh, and if they're clean, they would, they would be eligible for the administrative process. Uh, the second part of that process to be eligible would actually be a neighbor component where, uh, based on the conversation we heard from this committee, there would be um, that, that if there were no objections from neighbors, we would, we would propose a neighbor notification of uh, owners and occupants within 100 feet of the property that wanted to use extended home sharing. And if there's no objections uh, from those neighbors um, within that 100 feet, that that would uh, also qualify a host to uh, benefit from the administrative uh, streamlined process. Uh, the registration for this process would be similar to other, excuse me, other ministerial sign-offs and include costs that cover the mailing, fielding comments, and verifying complaints. Uh, this registration could be valid for one year as opposed to the regular home sharing for two years, at which point a renewal would be required. And this renewal process is important. Uh, the renewal would require a review, again, of nuisance activities, any violations within the last year. A verified nuisance violation could result in uh, uh, essentially uh, not being permitted to, to do extended home sharing uh, for three years. On the discretionary review process, uh, under the proposed framework, if you had a neighbor complaint or had a nuisance violation and therefore were ineligible for the ministerial extended home sharing registration, you'd be subject to a discretionary process that would be able to look into these issues in more detail including holding public hearings, making findings, and imposing potential conditions of approval on, on, the, uh, on the usage. Uh, this could be a director of planning determination with appeals by neighbors uh, within that 100 feet to the Area Planning Commission. Uh, we'd have the ability to have an optional public hearing based on the expectations for uh, uh, public controversy or, or, or the need to have a public hearing, uh, but that would be optional. And we would have findings um, Proposed, as proposed in the report, um, these would be uh, typical conditional use findings about neighborhood compatibility, and we also proposed an uh, additional four 
short-term rental specific findings dealing with issues such as um, the impact on street access, parking, and circulation, uh, the particulars of the uh, continued nuisance behaviors or, or uh, violations, whether there's an undue concentration of short-term rentals in the neighborhood, and whether that will lead to a cumulative impact to the residential character, as well as whether the home sharing space is well suited as a long-term rental. Uh, so th those sorts of considerations can be looked at through the discretionary process. This would be a two-year process uh, where that registration is good for two years, and again would require a renewal where we would again look, uh, have the ability to look at whether there's been nuisance infractions. Um, our report mentions potential additional penalties um, and enforcement. If we're going to allow people to come into this uh, extended home sharing on the front end, uh, there could be an expectation that we're going to be more strict on the enforcement. This could include a two-strike policy for revoking a home sharing registration permit rather than the three strikes uh, that's already in the ordinance for regular home sharing. Uh, we do want to point out that this framework would require extensive staff resources uh, to, to administer a discretionary process uh, and to administer and monitor this. So as our report notes, uh, potentially a new division within the planning department may be needed to uh, staff up this sort of work. Um, we don't know exactly how many cases could be resulting uh, as this process, but there are thousands of potentially eligible uh, listings today going beyond that cap. So the caseload could be anywhere from a couple hundred to a couple thousand cases. So we wanted to stress that. Um, in terms of options for the neighbor's sign-off for the process, um, we do want to acknowledge that the, the framework as proposed is rather unique in the city of Los Angeles and giving neighbors a real role in um, essentially determining the process that, that their neighbor would, would go through. So we're envisioning um, essentially the neighbor's uh, neighbor consent model. Um, we do do this in some other areas of the city, such as uh, some yard modifications, and it is done in other cities, but if the city council wanted to entertain a different approach uh, in lieu of the neighborhood consent, uh, it could just be a neighborhood notification process. And under this process, neighborhoods, neighbors within 100 feet would simply be notified of the extended home sharing. However, because it would be easier to register on the front end, we'd recommend a more stringent process to enforce against nuisance violations on the back end within that home sharing period. This, this could include a quicker revocation process or an inability to renew um, when it comes to your renewal using the administrative process. There could also be increased fines and penalties associated with this option. In a further effort to step up the enforcement, the city could also, for example, provide information on, to neighbors on how to register complaints easily, such as online, or a designated call-in number, and then treat future verified nuisance complaints very seriously. Uh, just to run through the final three items, um, we were asked to look at a lower overall cap for the home sharing. We're at 180 days now. Um, as, uh, just as way background, staff's original recommendation was for a cap of uh, between 90 and 120 days. Certainly, if there's an ability to go beyond the cap, uh, staff would, would continue to support a, a cap of between 90 and 120 days. On the fourth point, we were asked to look at the financial implications of a pass-through surcharge uh, to cover the administrative and enforcement costs related to home sharing and how that could impact the, the TOT, the transient occupancy tax currently proposed for this use. Uh, we, prevented, we presented options uh, for a surcharge or a fee in our report. Uh, the report summarizes that a $5 surcharge per night, per booking, per nights booked, uh, would likely be able to allow for the same amount of potential revenue for administration enforcement as a 10% TOT. So if the City Council wanted to substitute the current TOT-based funding mechanism with a fee-based funding mechanism, um, that $5 per night per booking fee would essentially be able to cover the, the expected revenues from the TOT. That TOT revenue could then be deposited to the general fund and saving the city somewhere between two and a half to four million dollars. Furthermore, the Plum Committee instructed the Planning Department to include language, specific, specific language in the ordinance about an opt-out provision for property owners. We've included this language in the draft for consideration, and as stated, we think this works with the existing intent of the ordinance and does not represent a significant change in policy. Finally, uh, we are instructed to prepare as needed any amendments to the associated environmental clearance uh, the department has been working on preparing the environmental uh, additional amendments that may be needed. Staff understands that any recommendations from Plum today are intended 
to result in a revised ordinance that will be sent to the City Planning Commission for its recommendation on the home sharing ordinance. Uh, and the department plans, therefore, to further revise and recirculate the environmental analysis after the full City Council direction is made clear. With that, we're happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Colleagues, uh, any remarks at this time? We will go to public comment uh, after this, and then we still can come back for more questions afterwards. But right now, any remarks? Remarks or questions for staff? Um, why don't we, if you want to do remarks now, let's see the questions for after public comment, see if that informs our further. Oh, okay, well, I'll, I'll just make. Either way, whatever I'll, you I'll wish. Make a quick remark, then I'll, I'll save my questions for after. Okay. Uh, which is just, I think, planning did a great job coming back with, with these kinds of things in terms of um, looking at the neighborhood sign-off process. I'm really excited that we are going to hopefully land this plane. We need, this is overdue. We want to get, we want to legalize home sharing and move this forward. And we're, we're, we have to walk that line uh, in terms of respect for, for the communities and allowing folks to be able to do this. So I have a number of questions and some, some suggestions. But, uh, but overall, I just wanted to, uh, you know, really appreciate what uh, the department did in terms of uh, fleshing out some of these things. I have some additional questions, but, I, but I'll, I'll let us move to public comment. Just one. Okay. Thank you, sir. Any other opening remarks? Mr. Well, Marks, Chair, yeah. appreciate the, uh, the report and also the enthusiasm expressed by uh, neighbors in this issue. And I look forward to the comments. Thank you. Thank you. So let's go to public comment now. Again, we will have one hour of public comment, considering that we have heard this item uh, four times in committee, and we've had uh, quite a bit of testimony in the overall policy, and uh, the last time we were here, we asked for more specific information on a possible um, discretionary process after a possible cap. So that's what we got back today in terms of the report. So each person has one minute to speak. I will call three people at a time. Rob Robin Cole, Vanessa Johnson, Peggy Sturdivant. Thank you for this opportunity. My question to the council, is this, land, is this the land of the free? Is this proposed ordinance empowering LA? Does the government control my entire existence? I've paid mortgage since 1997, yet I feel like a renter with a landlord. We hurt no one, but we help many. I work hard just like the others in this room, yet you want to lay me off for 245 days a year without pay, make me turn over my income and fees to the city, and then pay the Fed tax. How do I live? How can I empower LA if I'm starving? You're building nonstop. I would not rent long term if paid. I am a hospitality ambassador to South LA. Do you let your neighbors know if you have visitors? You have demonized my, my business. It's a war. We create jobs. Thank you. Your, but, uh, time, your time is up. Thank you. How did we get sorry how did we get from an ordinance where the issues could have been negotiated to work to an ordinance that was working now we have a report setting up huge bureaucratic departments funded by a blanket fee from all hosts across the city by placing an unburdened on hosts from working class areas regarding the hosting income. This design of this report is to limit the number of days of operation by requiring annual hurdles, limiting our businesses to hobby status. Our businesses are not hobbies. You have heard hours of testimony how we are able to care for our families and survive the high cost of living. These enormous fees could place a huge burden on hosting, 
working class families in this area. Thank you. Peggy, Jamone Woodley, Al Mitchell, Bryce Fuji. Well, hello, my name is Peggy J. Sturdivant. I've been here several times, and we're trying to pull the sugar coating off of this. Actually, what he said, what was discussed today, didn't put any money or monetary values on it. And zero com um, consideration is being held for, especially District 8, 9, and 10 in South Central Los Angeles, because what we're making at 30, 40, 50 dollars a day, we still have to take our water, power, lights, gas, everything out. I don't even understand why we're being debated with the hotel workers, because they've had three great years. They're making enough money to pay all these people to come sit here. It's costing me to be here. I'm paying my gas, my parking, and I'm not making the money that, that they're making. Besides, we have built up the, the visitors or the tourist, tourization in our neighborhoods to the point that they're discussing bringing hotels into our area now. So if we stop, we're servicing the individuals that cannot afford the hotels. So if we stop, they're going to stop too. Thank you. Steven Nazinski, Ed Coleman, Leslie Hope. Steven Nazinski, Ed Coleman, Leslie Hope. My name's Ed Coleman. My wife and I share a room in our Venice home of 37 years. Hello. Okay. My name's Ed Coleman. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Can you hello? hear him in the back? No? Is the audio guy here? He keeps uh, testing, testing. running to the restroom quite often. We need him here. <laughs> hello? One second. Okay, can you try that again, please? Testing. Is that any better? That's a little bit better. Yes. yes no? Yes? Yeah. Okay. My name is still Ed Coleman. My wife and I share a room in our Venice home of 37 years as a short-term rental. I was downsized five years ago, and for the last four years, the income from our guest room has been the primary source of our livelihood. Like every other host I know, I fully support fair and sensible regulations of the short-term rental market. Restricting short-term rentals to one's primary residence is the cornerstone of such regulations. However, placing arbitrary limits on how many days we can share our homes does nothing to address the root cause of the problems this law seeks to remedy. Commercial operators, absentee owners, and speculators have subverted the intent of home sharing for their economic gain. The law should focus on this, not on the people that share their homes. A cumbersome, expensive, and onerous registration process, as outlined in the latest report, wastes city resources, imposes thousands of dollars in administrative fees, and penalizes thousands of people like me who are simply trying to make ends meet. Thank you for your time. Leslie Hope, the most troubling aspect of this proposal is the bloated bureaucracy it would create. Ten planners, clerical staff, plus an additional module of 11 planners and staff smacks of a blatant power grab by city planners working hand in glove with the hotel industry. Not to mention it would be a conflict of interest for anyone who's worked on this ordinance to get a job enforcing it. It's not the job of the planning department to punish residents who are trying to maintain their homes in an increasingly expensive environment by using high fees of approximately $6,000 a year, a draconian res registration process, pitting neighbor against neighbor and diverting TOT from social programs when necessary administrative departments already exist, such as the finance department for business licenses and the city attorney's office for enforcement. Such an ordinance, rather than regulating home sharing, will eliminate it entirely by favoring hotels and players with multiple properties that can afford to pay or strike deals. Linda Lewin, Lisa Pearson, Derek Rath. 
name's Stephen Nashinsky. Um, Councilman Bullfield knows me well. I've been involved and I've followed <clears throat> the councilman's efforts and I think the effort that he made to try and make extended housing, home sharing available is a honorable effort. However, what we've created is another huge money sucking infrastructure business for the city. And it takes away all the opportunities. And what I just really want to say is that the extended home sharing with the neighbors allows them to arbitrarily look at the color of your skin, your religion, your, your marital status, if you have kids, all of these things can arbitrarily make them stop you from home sharing. And this is for people who survive from home sharing. And it's extremely expensive what you're proposing. Thank you. Hello, my name is Joe Pearson. This is my wife, Lisa Pearson. We were born and raised in Los Angeles. We've lived here in Venice Beach for 35 years. We bought our home 21 years ago, Councilman. We're about to be driven out of our house by this ordinance. It is not a fair ordinance. It does not address the issues that you want to address. What you're going to do, councilmen, all of you, are put us out of our houses. We're part of the community. We live in our house. We share our home with our guests. Airbnb kept us in our house. You're going to put us out. We're going to, you want to stabilize communities. You're going to put us out of Venice Beach. Again, Councilman Blumendahl, we've been there for 35 years. If this ordinance goes through as passed, we're going to have to sell our home. We share the home with our guests. We treat our neighbors with respect. This ordinance is onerous and is not the right solution. Look at cities that are doing it right. Check out Pasadena. The ordinance as it is needs to be thrown out and rethought. Thank you. Stephen Sloan, Craig Blaine, Mary Kate Denny. Well, okay, well, let's do this. Let's not have prolonged uh, applause. If you want applause, please do, but please, uh, the prolonged one will prevent us from moving through this quickly and having people hear their names as they're called. Stephen Sloan, Craig Blaine, Mary Kate Denny. No, you, anybody who comes up to the microphone could go. Please. Good afternoon. I'm Mary Kate Denny. <clears throat> For 50 years, I have lived in a home where I now have a connected room with an outdoor entrance in which I welcome people who are parents to people who are living in the neighborhood, young adults, to tourists who I might have been showing the city to, to also business people who are doing business with Century City, which I live right next to. I'm addressing the cap of 120 days with a fee of up to $7,000 to do more days. I find this most unjust as I have been able to support myself since the downfall or the crash of 2009, when as a photographer, my income dropped drastically. Just as you would not want your income of, I think it's 175000 and up, cut in half, I too want to stay in my home bringing in both money, tax money, and revenue for our city. Up. Thank you. Your time is I up, do not want to be forced to sell my home. Thank, Thank you. you. The charm of staying at someone's home is that each home is a one of a kind. The best part of LA is the eclectic architecture, unique decor, and the specific character of different landscaping and views. Should we try to limit the number of days people are allowed to Uber so that we can force people into taxis? No. The sharing economy is upon us. We need to accept and embrace the change. Money aside, it's wrong to deny good people the opportunity to do what they want to do. Why deny good people the opportunity to be where they want to be? 
Government intervention is not necessary. The marketplace should determine which companies survive. Most Airbnb guests are peaceful, and for those who are not, we simply need harsher penalties. Just because some people speed on the freeway doesn't mean that the freeways should only be open a third of the year. There should be no cap for responsible hosts. I do not support an application or an expensive permit to do what I want to do with my home. Without this extra income, a lot of people will be forced to sell their homes. Things are fine as they are. Thank you. Brand Boitner, Conrad Hurt, Janine Weist. Welcome. Hi. After two years of hosting nearly 365 days a year, I have not had one complaint or comment from any neighbor in my area. I take pains to ensure that no guest of mine ever creates a situation giving my neighbors reason to complain. Most hosts are just like me. Still, I understand there may be neighbors out there who, have, who do have reason to make good faith complaints about the manner in which a neighbor hosts. For those situations, go ahead and provide a dedicated administrative channel uh, of communication so that those complaints are heard and acted upon swiftly. Force the host to offend to correct the problem and penalize them up to taking away hosting privileges if they don't. But to give neighbors the ability to simply object uh, when there is no history of problems sets up the real possibility of arbitrary, mean-spirited, even discriminatory actions to take place. <laughs> Neighbors who don't like the host for whatever reason can decide to object when they'd otherwise have no reason to complain. A neighbor wielding that sort of power could potentially undermine my ability to keep my home and sustain myself in these still challenging times. Thanks. I'm a 61-year-old Airbnb host in Sherman Oaks. I am not a corporation. I host around 220 days a year. I urge no cap for primary residence hosts. Simply put, the proposed fees for me to be able to host for 220 days would be, in fact, onerous, which somebody on the panel mentioned you do not want to have happen, but they would be. We already pay high house taxes, plus you do get your 14%. We are trying to save our homes, save our neighborhoods from runaway development, and retain some semblance of a middle class. I would have to charge two or three hundred dollars a night to afford the fees in the thousands that your latest iteration suggests. Please legislate to get rid of the bad players, but allow me to age in my home of 25 years. Thank you. Thank you. Amy Walsh, Eric Stolp, Rob Perna. Hi, my name is Mark. I'm an owner of an occupy or a, an owner occupied host of an RSO property in Echo Park. I'm here to speak out against the RSO ban on home sharing, the proposed caps and fees. In 08, I lost everything but my triplex and have struggled to hang on. I converted my extra room to an economy apartment which I rent Airbnb. My story is typical in RSO neighborhoods where we are often low cash flow owners with our homes being both our greatest expense and our greatest uh, resource. The proposed caps are set to the break even point of what we would make if we stopped home sharing and rented at the top of the market. But why are we the most vulnerable told we have to operate our business at a break even and pay fees that will break our monthly budgets? I'm Pretty certain the hotels, luxury condos, and rich developers who knock down affordable housing to build are not being held to this same break-even standard. <laughs> Nor are they charged the fees that they could easily absorb. Thank you so much. By the way, I have something for you guys. Who do I give it to? Hi, I'm Linda, and I've... All right, hold one second. What's your name? Linda Mitchell. Linda. Okay. Mitchell. Uh, I did not call your name. Oh, I'm sorry. I couldn't hear you. Yeah. All of a sudden, we have like five people there, and I'm, I'm calling three per... So what's your name? My name is Amy Walsh, okay. and I've been living in my home in Sherman Oaks for 30, over 30 years now. And I've been an Airbnb host since last uh, summer um, when I retired. My unit has no kitchen and um, has a separate entrance, but it's inappropriate for any time, type of long-term rental. 
the majority of my guests have been visiting family members in the neighborhood who have limited space for uh, visitors. Rather than a lumpy couch or expensive hotel room miles away, uh, they, I offer them a comfortable private suite within walking distance of their families. I typically host guests 15 to 18 days a month. I oppose arbitrary uh, caps, cumbersome regulations, and draconian fees. We are not corporations, we are homeowners who are trying to meet uh, our financial needs. Require registration to identify rentals and keep an eye on them, but keep the fees nominal. Most of us have been successfully renting without complaints. Do not impose unnecessary bureaucracy. Right. Thank and I you. also propose the taxes and A fees go to helping the homeless. Thank you. What's your name, sir? Rob Perna. Rob Perna. Rob Perna. Gotcha. Thank you. Good afternoon. After Rob Perna is Solange Pace. Maura Crisologo, Heather Santora. Thank you, welcome. Good afternoon and thank you for your time today. My name is Rob Pernan, I'm a 22 year resident of Los Angeles. Uh, and I reside, I'm a tenant in an RSO unit. Um, five years ago, I flexed my entrepreneurial spirit and began independent consulting. Um, Many of the jobs take me out of the state and out of the country for about six months of the year, the last five years. I also flexed my entrepreneurial spirit by putting $4,000 into my apartment, refurbishing it with a lot of elbow grease as well, some things that the landlord would never do. Um, so I have a few asks here. Uh, please do not restrict the RSO units for tenants that reside in them. Please do not institute a cap that goes under 180 days, and please do not require neighbors or landlords to sign off on or, or to, to require their permission. Um, thank you. Thank you. You call my name, right? My name is Eric Stolp. Yes, I did. Eric okay. Stolp. Thank you. Welcome. Hello, everyone. Um, in 2007, before 2008, I was a real estate agent and flipping homes. As you know, the market crashed in 2008. I bought that triplex in 2007 with my family, my mom, my brothers. And after the market went down, um, I had to short sell the property. And the landlord let me stay there and to keep past there, I, I offered him to fix the house. And I started doing, uh, working on Airbnb. And since then, we've been there. Please, uh, that's how we're making a living now. We found a way to, to you know, um, benefit. And if you uh, place a cap and uh, makes us go those highest fees, we're going to have to find something else to do. You know, and that's going to be pretty tough. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, City Council uh, and to the rest of the members. My name is Solange. I'm a single mother of two. Um, I was diagnosed with cervical cancer in 2016. It has been hard to feed my two kids and maintain my home in Los Angeles. I had to work 14 hours to stay above water and rely on the kindness of others around me to help me with my children. To me, this was not living. Airbnb helped me to save my home, pay my medical costs, and have more time with my children. I opened my home to Airbnb community in June 2017. I immediately realized that this was part of my calling. I was helping so many people who were traveling and locals to have a peaceful LA experience in my home, and at the same time, they were helping me live a better life. I was, I'm always uh, helping my neighborhood local businesses by referring my guests to markets, restaurants, and activities near my home. The positive influence of Airbnb should not be ignored. If I could only Airbnb four months out of the year, I would lose the time with my kids. I will more likely lose my home, and I will have to start from ground zero again. God bless you and everybody in this room. Thank you. Heather Santora. After leaving an abusive relationship, me and my sons moved three times in four years. Our instability was driven by the high cost of housing in LA. Finally, we moved into a house with a one-bedroom back house, which we rent out as a short-term rental 350 days per year. 
Please hear me. We can only stay in our house because of the income that we receive from hosting. This report, if passed as is, would devastate hosts like me. Reading and complying with this report is like playing with the game of whack-a-mole. Restricting my business to 180 days cuts my income in half. It cuts the tourism do dollars that flow into my East LA neighborhood in half, and local businesses love my guests. I earn $24,000 a year from hosting. If requiring a $6,000 annual registration fee is crazy, I also own and operate a cleaning company. I pay $200 a year to register that company. Choosing between housing or my cleaning company, which employs 15 single moms like me, is crazy. I'm asking for an open calendar, reasonable registration fees, and allowing home-based entrepreneurs like myself to you. be able to host. Thank you. Your time is up. Welcome. My name is Mara Crisologo. I'm a resident homeowner in Silver Lake of 21 years, and I earn my living by sharing three guest rooms in my home. As a stage four cancer survivor with radiation disease, I need to work from home. Home sharing allows me to be productive and earn a modest income. Today you're considering this ordinance that will allow me and thousands of other disabled and limited income hosts to earn sub-poverty level wages. Why do this? People using their homes to make ends meet and pay bills should be encouraged, not punished. The new neighbor approval process must be objective or neighbors will just say no. There's no reason to limit the number of days a host can rent guest rooms in their own home or guest house. No cap on home-based hosts and bring fees in line with potential income generation. Thank you. Mark Bachner, Angela Aaron, John Choi. My name, <clears throat> my name is Angela Aaron. I'm a homeowner and single mom with two teenage kids. My daughter was recently accepted into the distinguished Notre Dame Academy High School. She is 13 years old and worked very hard all year to be accepted into this school. My ability to pay for her next year's tuition is solely dependent on the fact that I am able to rent out two spare rooms in my home through Airbnb. Enforcing a universal 120-day cap on the number of nights I can share my home with guests from all over the world will severely diminish my and my children's quality of life. The 6000 fee on top of the TOT we already pay would be a severe blow to our ability to live as a family in a dignified way. I say this respectfully. Large hotels can easily fork out any amount of money to show support at City Hall. For us, however, life is different. We are ordinary people trying to survive and raise our children in a forever accelerating world. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon, council members. John Choi with Airbnb. Home sharing puts thousands of dollars in the pockets of LA residents, contributes $1.4 billion to LA's local economy, and to date has generated more than $65 million in new tax revenue to the city. Home sharing is also now playing an even greater role in stabilizing our neighborhoods. 33% of local hosts now rely on this income to avoid foreclosure or eviction from their own homes. This represents a 10% increase from just a year ago. These are senior retirees on a fixed income, <laughs> middle class empty nesters who have converted a child's bedroom or a back house, parents, husbands and wives, who have faced medical emergencies or come upon hard times. These aren't commercial operators. These aren't corporations or landlords with attorneys and consultants. These are retired school teachers and artists, costume designers, electricians, and plumbers who will be directly impacted by the recommendations for thousands of dollars of permit fees, a process that pits neighbor against neighbor, and dozens of bureaucratic hopes, hoops to jump through. We urge you to keep these faces and stories in mind as you task your vote today. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, Josine McGee, Lila Levy, Kevin Debesh. Josine McGee, Lila Levy, Kevin Debesh. I 
I have some handouts. Sergeant at Arms will get them from you. Honorable Council Persons, my name is Leela Levy. I am a 38 year retired LAUSD arts teacher. I was disabled, saving a student's life, forcing me to retire early. I am requesting you grandfather in with no caps, all existing primary owned primary residence hosts with no extra fees or processes. The annual $6,000 fee for primary residence homes is draconian. Exemptions must be made for the disabled, retired, teachers, and low income. Registration fees should be in those of small business. Primary residence home sharing needs to be fairly resolved before the 2024 Olympics. Caps on primary owned res homes are unprecedented, but my home is in a commercially zoned area. So what about commercially zoned neighborhoods? Thank you. Excuse me, I don't know if you said Elisa McGee. I couldn't hear the name. I said Josine McGee. Oh, Josine, J O Z I N E McGee. Not here? Okay. Judy Goldman, David Ewing, Linda Lux. Judy Goldman, David Ewing, Linda Lux. Good afternoon. My name is Judy Goldman, and I thank you for finally getting this ordinance to the point where the city can take action. During the years this has been under consideration, we've watched helplessly as commercial investors buy properties for the sole purpose of operating short-term rentals instead of renting to long-term residents who are badly in need of homes. We've watched short-term rentals hollow out communities and decimate the diversity that made our neighborhoods special and desirable in the first place. If a discretionary process to exceed the citywide cap is allowed, then the citywide cap needs to be 90 days or below with the primary residence clearly defined, and I say clearly, as the home you live in for 275 days a year, which is what has been done in San Francisco very successfully. San Francisco has seen illegal short-term rentals eliminated. Did you hear me? Illegal short-term rentals have been eliminated and long-term rentals returning to the market at a rate over 600%. We need strong and enforceable ordinance. Thank you. Your, your Thank time you. is up. Thank you. I, excuse me, excuse me. I, I would advise people who are shouting I, out of turn. I, one moment, one moment. I'm speaking. I have an article One moment, for you. I am speaking. I'm sorry, I am speaking. Do not cut me off, please. I am speaking. I would advise people in the audience do not shout out of turn because we are uh, trying to conduct a meeting here. If we were to allow that, at any time, then anybody who wants to shout out will, 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 and then we won't be able to get through our business. So please, do not shout out of business, out of line. Uh, if you want to applaud after you agree with something or somebody, that is fine. But your prolonged applause, your shouting, would only delay this meeting, and I would have to cut you off at some point if it starts getting out of hand, because we need to be fair to everyone who has differences of opinion, and that way everyone can be heard and we could get through this meeting. Thank you. Next speaker. Hi, my name is Linda Lux. I am a 50-year resident of the Venice area and a longtime community activist who now works for Venice Community Housing for the last six years. Venetians know the importance of knowing your neighbors. It's our safety net. And what's happened, if you don't know your neighbors, the fabric of the community has disintegrated all over Venice and other parts of the city. Um, if you have short-term rentals on your, any of your blocks, you'll know what I mean. No one has a problem with people renting out rooms. People have always done that. It's the business aspect of it. You can rent something full time. You don't have to be making more money. You, don't, you can do it by not losing your home by renting out um, a permanent um, person. But 90 day cap is really important because that, um, 
it helps those that make ends meet. You can make it enough if you don't rent it full time. And if you decide to opt in a discretionary process, it needs to be robust and strong and really enforceable or it'll be back to where we are now, which is completely unenforced. So thank you and please do the right thing. Thank you. Welcome. Good afternoon. I'm David Ewing, longtime resident of Venice, where we've lost over 1,200 homes to short-term rentals, mostly affordable units that will never come back unless you act, act to control the illegal short-term rental market. When the city fails to enforce a law, the abusers soon believe it's their right. And who can blame them when the city's taking a cut of the profits? Our city's in a housing crisis, choked by a vacancy rate that's down to just over 4%, and that's a number we should all be ashamed of. It's jacked up rents beyond the means of over 60% of renters and pushed many into homelessness. Meanwhile, landlords convert <clears throat> to even more lucrative uh, businesses, uh, an even more lucrative business, one that robs the city of desperately needed housing. Our short-term rental ordinance must end the incentives for deepening our crisis. That means a 90-day cap that can't be gamed by those who know their way through the discretionary loopholes. We need real regulation, and that means enforceability is key. Thank you very much. Thank you. Sylvia Arif, Jonathan Litvak, James Litz. Sir, we ask that you do not shut out out of turn. Uh, let that be a first warning for you, sir, because then I might have to ask our Sergeant at Arms to remove anybody who continues to shut out. Thank you. Sylvia Erith, Jonathan Lidback, James Litz. Hello, my name is Sylvia Arath, and I'm a 40 plus year resident of Venice. Thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to speak. As we know, Los Angeles is, is experiencing the greatest housing crisis we have ever witnessed with an unacceptably row, low 4% vacancy rate. Short-term rentals are worsening the crisis by taking units off the rental market, which is why we're all here, of course. Building new units can only do so much if we continue to lose affordable housing to short-term rentals and especially speculators. I am therefore asking that you do the right thing and recommend the common sense regulations you have been considering for the past two years. This includes instituting a reasonable cap on hosts of 90 days per year. I support hosts who need the extra money provided by renting a room in their homes. Not, however, commercial operators who, ha who have made a full-time business out of short-term rentals. In spite of enforcement challenges, other cities have moved forward to protect their residents with regulations on short-term rentals. San Francisco has been very sec successful in their regulation. So can Los Angeles. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm James Liz from the Association of Realtors. We support this uh, short-term rental industry. Uh, it provides homeowners with the financial assistance, utilizes excess space from empty nesters, and shows off our great neighborhoods. Short-term rentals augment the booming tourism industry by providing options outside of hotels. There's plenty of business to go around. Realtors support the proposal, a proposal that allows for legal short-term rentals, prohibits short-term rentals in rent-stabilized housing, and allows an apartment building owner to opt out of inclusion on the short-term rental platforms. Thank you. Thank you. Jane Taguchi, Stacy Burmaster, Rabbi Israel Baruch. Welcome. Hi, good afternoon. My name is Jonathan Litbeck. I'm the general manager of the Sheridan Grand Downtown. I'm also an associate of Marriott International, and I also have several associates here in the room today that I'm speaking on behalf and representing. I just want to start by thanking you for your time, diligence, and uh, tremendous forethought in going through the process over the course of the 
past year plus and trying to review every angle of this and find a compromise that works and benefits most. Maybe not all. On that behalf, I certainly do support what was proposed earlier in terms of uh, you know, a re restricted short-term uh, rental proposal as I think that it best serves the community, it preserves the associates that work and live in the community, and I think serves everybody's benefit. Thank you for your time. Thank you. My name is Stacy Burmaster. As a longtime resident of Los Angeles, I'm here today to express my concern about the impact of short-term rentals are having on our affordable housing stock. We are in the middle of the greatest housing crisis Los Angeles has ever witnessed. We have a vacancy of barely 4%, so thank you for including the prohibition of rent-stabilized housing in the pro proposed ordinance. However, the proposed 120-day cap and process for exceeding this cap is troubling. Solid research tells us that a cap exceeding 85 nights per year will result in property owners renting short-term instead of renting to the many people desperately in need of this housing. I also urge you to close the loopholes that allow for partial tours, conversion, and conversion of apartment hotels. We've already seen the long-term residential units taken away and used for short-term rentals via these questionable conversions. I urge you to do the right thing. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon, council members. My name is Israel Baruch. Um, I'm a rabbi. I'm here representing my family and my community. I've been here before, and I apologize for taking your time again. But I just, I'm just i here because the, the problem is grave. I live in a six-unit uh, six apartment building. Two of those units are full-time Airbnbs. People don't have where to live. These people are complaining about how they can't afford the, the houses that they own and live in. There's people who are going homeless on the street because they simply can't afford rent. It's 90, 90 days is not enough if you ask me. Who goes on vacation more than 90 days a year? I, I don't know people who do, and if they do, they, they, they shouldn't be renting Airbnb as an income because apparently they have enough money that they don't need to be renting Airbnbs. We need a greater cap than 90 days. It's, it's just not enough. People, people are, are coming to me and asking me in the end of the month, Rabbi, can, can I borrow from the synagogue $500 because I don't have enough for rent? People are coming like, my son just got married. Guess what? He moved to Vegas because we can't afford a unit in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you. <laughs> Susan Hunter, Kendall Mayhew, Johnny Ayon. Welcome, Ms. Taguchi. My name is Jane Taguchi. I am LA born, a UCLA grad, and Silver Lake resident for 22 years. I attended every single hearing in regards to short-term rentals since 2014 because an Airbnb opened across the street from me. Not someone living in the house, not a host renting a room, instead a rich couple renting out the entire house to groups for fraternity, vacation, photo shoots, and convention years. Airbnb rentals have been allowed free reign for too long. The most important thing I want to say is that I treasure my home, a place to live, raise family, and have peaceful enjoyment. Lately, I have sadness. When I open my door, I see a house that reminds me of my bad ex nightmare experiences with this unregulated short-term rental problem. Please, protect the millions like me who love their homes, but may not be aware that a hotel could open up next door. Have Airbnb pay the back taxes like San Francisco did. LA needs the revenue, that's for sure. Make enforcement possible. I treasure peaceful enjoyment of my home. Thank you. Thank you. Council members, my name is Susan Hunter. I'm with the Los Angeles Tenants Union. I'm the Hollywood local caseworker. And originally I was involved in the uh, ordinance because the hybrid tours that was created by the planning department as a workaround for wealthy developers creating large-scale projects to not have to obey the home-sharing ordinance. And I'm glad to see that that is addressed in this version. If the question on the table is, should we have input from the community early on or no input at all, I would caution that you have it early on. As much as we know that the city of Los Angeles loves to be sued, perhaps the best idea is to make sure that the communities have the enforcement that they need in these processes early on, as this is a commercial use coming into our neighborhoods. As we look at item number four on the same agenda, when it comes to enforcement, there's a visible difference between 
between what the city says we do and what we actually do. It shouldn't take years for the city to respond, but it does. Thank you for finally bringing this to a vote so we can hopefully be in practice the city we claim to be in word. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your service. My name is Jed Palker. I served on Venice Neighborhood Council's Land Use and Planning Committee for three and a half years and as a publicly elected official as a board member for four years between 2006 and 2016. I understand these issues. I also lived next to an illegal short-term rental for seven years. The landlord sold the house when he saw this legislation coming. That was two years ago. Not only do short-term rentals help strangle our rental market, they've also provided unscrupulous landlords with a way to game the Ellis Act by claiming that they're leaving the rental business to go into hospitality. And they've used this as a threat to help push tenants out for their personal, illegal, commercial gain. As we consider this today, Mark Zuckerberg is testifying before Congress because his company gamed the system and because regulators failed to act timely to set limits. He knew and they knew. The t-shirt I wear today says, stamp money out of politics. That's what it's talking about. 60 nights per year as a benchmark, a carve out for true hosts who simply demonstrate the need, consistent accountability and enforcement for unscrupulous landlords, and fast action before homelessness increases. Thank you. Thank you. Steve Ducey, Ahmad Butler, Charudi Pati Banda. Welcome. Hi, my name is Kendall Mayhew. Um, I'm a staff organizer with People Organized for Westside Renewal, our power. Um, I could speak from that perspective today, but I will speak from my personal perspective. Um, and I can, I can relate to what a lot of these uh, Airbnb, landlord, uh, Airbnb hosts have talked about, the financial hardships that they're facing and the potential for losing their home. And I can relate to that because I have already been forced out of my home. Um, I was evicted last year by my landlord. She is now currently Airbnb being my home full time. I've actually seen her at these meetings uh, on behalf of Airbnb. Um, that's an extremely intense thing. My, the new apartment that my partner and I live in is $600 more a month. Uh, we've changed everything around in our life. We're spending 50% of our income on rent. Um, in a time when the majority of the people who are homeless on the street have been in permanent housing within the last two years, and that's what's going on right now. We're not talking about people who don't want help. We're talking about people who cannot pay rent. Um, we have to protect people's need to have housing before people's need to have a business um, that provides a full-time income. And sure. the context of Airbnb, which is a billion-dollar company, a billion-dollar company, um, and the context of that is, is really important in this Thank case. You. Thank you. The sea of red you see in this chamber today represents thousands of hotel workers on the front lines of a multi-billion dollar tourism industry. Workers that have fought for living wages, health benefits, safer workplaces, and respect on the job. Now we fight for fair housing practices, the ability to live where we work and not have our homes snatched out from under us, only to be turned into short-term rentals by owners, landlords, who are putting profits before people. We are asking for, we're not asking for much, just common sense regulation that keeps bad actors from skirting the true intent of Airbnb's platform and taking precious housing resources off the market. Some on the other side of this debate will have you believe that our motives are purely monetary. We provide a service that Airbnb could never replicate and our guests pay, our guests pay a premium for it. We are here representing men and women who love this city, work in it and for this city, and want to stay in this city without giving up the gains that we fought so hard to obtain in our struggle for living wages and respect. It's time to stop stalling and move this measure forward. Thank you. Good afternoon, Chair, Chairman Huizar and members of the committee. Charani Patibanda with the Glazer Weil Law Firm on behalf of California Hotel and Lodging Association. We appreciate the committee moving this ordinance forward today. Uh, regulation is badly needed to protect our housing stock. We also support the ban on partial and entire tours conversions of short-term rental, um, of, excuse me, of housing to short-term rental units under the tours uh, zoning code provisions. And lastly, we ask the council to work with the city attorney's office to review all settlements and litigation currently active and settled 
between short-term rental platforms and other jurisdictions in the state of California and across the country in order to make this particular ordinance defensible and enforceable. Thank you very much. Thank you. Gloria Colazo, Michael Menivar, Blanca Rojano, West LA City. Council member is my, my council member is my Bonnie. I'm a single mom. I have two kids. One of them is 16, another one is 17. They are West LA cadets for the police officers. So I have to work three jobs in order they can have an apartment in place living way to live in. I live in with my dad right now because I can afford it. I just asking you please grant this petition we have for with you in order to get my children grow up and have a better well, way to live. And yes, I'm a single mom and I have work and like everybody in here, just asking you can control those friends in order we can pay less and have a place to live. Thank you. Thank you. Gloria Colazo, Michael Menjivar, not here. Okay. Michael McLean, Heather Siegel, Roy Saman. Hi everyone, my name is Mike McLean, lifetime LA resident. I'm very happy to know that you are actually moving forward with regulation of this. Every other large city on the planet is making regulations behind this, and they're not scared to regulate because it's hard to regulate. Um, I appreciate the concerns of the folks who are making money in order to stay in their homes, but the money they are making is being made on the backs of the affordability crisis in LA right now. So there's an invisible cost here that's impossible to quantify. Um, I, I, I strongly urge a 90-day cap. If you actually do a discretionary process, give it teeth. I know you are all capable of this. We have an incredible city council, an incredible planning department who know how to work with these complicated issues. I would also like to add that it is an absolute red herring that Airbnb cannot regulate itself. They own the data. That's how they make their money. The city of Paris has a 120-day limit, and Airbnb is doing it themselves because the city said you must. Thank you very much. Too. Good afternoon, my name is Heather Siegel. I live in Hollywood Hills and I run a series of neighborhood watch groups in the San Fernando Valley, Hollywood area, and West Hollywood um, with about 15,000 members in it. My neighborhood has been terrorized by Airbnb rentals. Um, <laughs> it has been. <laughs> um, it's, it's a really unsettling feeling knowing, you know, you don't know who is living across the street, a revolving door. Um, you know, with Neighborhood Watch, LAPD, council, you know, we're, we're always being told as a neighborhood to know who your neighbors are, but it's impossible when, you know, you, you have different people staying there every two or three nights. So, um, I also, it is a little bit annoying for me to hear as a defense that people um, are unwilling to live within their means or downsize um, after the market crash. I actually foreclosed on my house. Um, anyway, I don't see it as an excuse. I'd like to know um, Thank you. what happened to work ethic and getting a Thank having you. a job. Thank you, your time Thank is you. up. Thank you. <laughs> Daisy Marco. Shay Crabtree, Rich Kohler. My name is Daisy Marco. I've lived in Los Angeles all my life. And believe me when I say no one wants to live near an air, next to an Airbnb. No one wants already limited parking taken up by additional cars, 
trash left on their property and their streets that don't get uh, street cleaning, a constant stream of strangers coming in and out of their neighborhood at all hours, Reveler, reveling vacationers talking all night in the backyard, cigarettes flicked onto dry brush in the a fire prone area, and regularly waiting two hours for the police to respond to excess noise from a half dozen guests of absentee hosts. As a homeowner living in an area zoned strictly for residential living, I don't have the right to make my property a bar, restaurant, or retail shop. Why allow it to be used as a hotel? If you allow this, I beg you to mandate that the host be present at the property at all times they have guests, limit the allowed days to 90, and provide neighbors and law enforcement an efficient way to eliminate nuisance houses. Thank you. Hi, my name is Shay Crabtree. I, I have lived in Silver Lake for 18 years. Um, I have the misfortune of living to a property owner who has turned multiple private homes into uh, short-term rentals. The vacationing and the partying and the noise and the nuisance and the um, litter is constant 24-7, 365 nuisance. We have no protection. It's unregulated. The free market is terrible at regulating itself. Please consider pushing forward with um, all the fine work you've done on this and protecting neighborhoods and supporting our uh, unions. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Deanne Newkirk, Leroy Guillory, Profatis, Joyce Chapman. Welcome. Thank you. Bishop L.J. Guillory. I represent Bay Pack. Uh, we have Hollywood, Beverly Hills. Uh, I said my name is Bishop L.J. Guillory. I also represent Bay Pack. Uh, I'm here because I'm concerned. I'm concerned that there's two issues here, and one side seems to not even know that the other side is begging for uh, some understanding. If, if workers can't afford housing, we're going to have more homeless people. Los Angeles has record number homeless. I think that it's interesting that many of the homeowners, and I know some of them, nice people, but they're not the business people that are buying these homes and putting people in them and allowing them to have parties and all kinds of cynical things that's going on. I'm asking you, city council member, to take just one minute to think, would you want it by your house? Welcome. Hi. I'm here for, um, because Prophet is, is not here. My name is Marcelli. And I wouldn't be here for sorry, two hours I, waiting. I'm sorry. Yeah. I, um, if you want to put in your name, we, we do not substitute names here. It's just a rule because otherwise people would be doing that all the time and people would just sign other people's names up and come up and speak. So you would have to add your name to the list. I really apologize, but it's just a rule. We allow it. it just other people will do it too. You, you just can't come up and speak for other people. I apologize. Yeah, well, we do need rules. I've been here for two hours. You've been here for two hours? Uh, ma'am, if you want to take, I'll give you half a minute, ma'am, if you want to speak. And if you could give your name for the record. Okay. Thank you. My name is Marcel, and we bought a house in 2005 to raise our family in a community where we can borrow a cup of sugar from our neighbor, where we can have play dates with our neighbors, where we can go trick-or-treating with our neighbors, we can have our kids' birthday parties with our neighbors, where we can go to school with our neighbors. I don't know my neighbor. He doesn't live there. He just owns that property. It's just one of their many rental properties. And every day, every morning, I wake up and I have to ask myself, oh, who is my neighbor today? Is it a pedophile? Is it, is it a drug addicted? Are they going to have another party late until late at night? Will I have to call the cops again like I did last weekend? I want to wake up and not have to worry about my kids. 
I want real neighbors. I want more cushion balls. I want more sujimotos. I want my daughter to play in the Thank backyard you. safe. Thank you. Ma'am, what's your name? Ma'am, for the record, what's your name? Just. Marceli. Okay, thank, thank you very much. Rose Bailey, Victoria Tan, Linda Milhouse. Not here? Coming up? Okay, I'll move on. Denise Hill, Carla Andara, Margaret Malloy. My name is Denise Hill. I live in Los Angeles, and I am a homeowner. Mr. Harris Dawson, you are my councilman. And we talked last year. I had an issue last year with a neighbor that we spoke about. His house burned down by 84-year-old neighbor that we discussed. He lost his home. He's homeless now. He was part of Airbnb. This was happened when you don't know your neighbors. And he was a drug dealer and prostitution. And we discussed this. I had a guest that was violated with a knife. This has to stop. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Good afternoon. Hello. My name is Carla, and I live in a mid Wilshire area. My city councilman is Gil Cedillo. I'm a single parent, and even though I have a good union job, because there are not enough affordable places in the neighborhood, my five children and I have been forced into homelessness. Because of this issue, I have to live with my parents and I'm sharing a one bedroom apartment and, and have no, virtually no privacy. And after coming home from a long day of cleaning rooms, I'm exhausted, I'm not even able to um, lie on a bed or have a place to rest my head on. It's becoming a bigger barrier for my family and I and everyone in my community. I grew up in this area and I deserve to have a place to live a bed to sleep on, and this is why I'm here to urge you to pass the ordinance. Thank you. Hello, my name, my name is Margaret Malloy. I'm a renter. People who own property have alternative ways to make money besides short-term rentals. They can have roommates or tenants in accessory units. Ren renters do not have those options. In a city with 65% renters, it is the responsibility of our city leadership to protect the rental housing stock of our city. In 2016, the leadership of the city of Los Angeles decided to take transient occupancy tax from Airbnb while short-term rentals in residential neighborhoods were illegal. That is money laundering. Why did our mayor and city council agree? Taking that money has created an unfair advantage in negotiations with a company and industry that is aggressive and disruptive everywhere they operate. The city must protect renters. There was a 23% increase in homelessness across LA County in 2016 to 2017, and a staggering 75% surge in the last six years. The correlation is obvious. Thank Do your you. job, please. Thank you. <laughs> Kurt Peterson. Anna Mendez, Bishop Mendez. Good afternoon, uh, Councilmember Wezar and members of the this committee. Um, I am Kurt Peterson, co-president of Unite Here Local 11. We represent 30,000 food service and hotel workers in Los Angeles. Let me cut to the chase. If this law were merely about people who once in a while rent out their extra bedroom, we would have landed this a long time ago. 
But it's not about that at all. Airbnb does not own a single hotel room, yet it is valued more than Hyatt Corporation and Hilton Corporation combined. Airbnb's value derives from a simple but pernicious formula. Transform homes into hotel rooms. Any housing, whether a home in Hollywood Hills or an apartment building in West Adams or the 300-room level apartment building in downtown Los Angeles that is turned into hotels, worsens our housing crisis and makes hotel workers' jobs less secure. Today, we need to end this growing displacement. Today, we need to begin the process of returning these illegal hotels back into homes. Thank you. My name is Ana Mendez. I'm a banquet server at the JW Merritt in LA Life. I'm here today to ask you to pass, this, to pass the short-term rental ordinance as soon as possible. I think this ordinance is very important because it affects the hospitality industry standards. I work hard every day to give an outstanding service to my guests. When people buy apartment buildings and turn them into hotels, it hurts me and the standard that we fought for many years. That standard is for our guests, but it's also for the quality of our lives and our families. Thank you. Thank you. Bishop Mendez, not here. Rich Magram, Maria Virgen, James Russell, and Unique Jackson. Welcome. Thank you. I'm Rich Magram. Magram. We live next door to a house owned by a rich foreigner who lives in Europe and spends about two weeks of the year at his home in Los Feliz. The rest of the time, he rents the house out to, on vacation rental by owner. His guests, who stay for a few nights, can't wait to jump in the pool, hot tub, blast the music, start drinking, and keep us up until five in the morning, night after night, after night until they leave and the next guests arrive and the same thing begins again. The owner couldn't care less about Los Feliz or Los Angeles. When I spoke with him so kindly about the noise problem, he said for me to not disturb him. The home which we worked so hard for and that we love, we no longer even want to live in. We hope that you will stop this destruction of our neighborhoods and of our city. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, my name is James Russell. I live on the K-Town area near Hancock Park. My city councilman is David Rue. My first one-bedroom apartment when I moved out here was under the roof of a slumlord. He had a very long history of violations, and my unit had gas leaks in the stove, the oven, the heater. There were rats, there were roaches, fire exits were blocked, there were holes in the walls, and he was still able to get away with charging $1,100 a month. Now that was three years ago. My current apartment is $1,400 a month. That's $100 a year. My wages are not keeping up with that. Rent keeps rising because there's too few options. Everyone in this room, especially on the Airbnb side, is also feeling the consequences of this housing crisis. It's time now to pass this ordinance. Thank you. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es María Virgen. Un momento, vamos a agarrar la persona para traducir lo que va a decir. Gracias. Gracias. Buenas tardes. Mi nombre es María Virgen. Gracias. Uh, My name is María Virgen. Soy residente de Los Ángeles. I'm a resident of Los Ángeles. Mi representante de concilio es Joey Buscaíno. My city council is Joe, Joe Buscaíno. Para mí es importante que pasen esta ordenanza para que tengamos tra como trabajadores como yo. Uh, for me, it's very important that you enact this ordinance so workers like me. Un hogar que podamos pagar una familia y yo. We can have an, uh, a home and we can have our families as well. No tenemos privacidad porque no podemos pagar rentas tan altas como para poder tener una casa de dos o tres recámaras. We don't have any privacy because we cannot pay high rents uh, because we're not able to afford housing for two or three bedrooms. 
Por favor, apoyen familias como yo para que mis hijos y nietos tengamos un hogar donde podamos vivir mejor. Please support families like me so my children and I can live in a better home. Ok, gracias. Thank you so much. Gracias. James Russell and Unique Jackson. Okay, that concludes our public comment period. Yes, um, yes ma'am. Excuse me, sir, and yep. panel committee. I've been here since 2 o'clock. I did sign up, and I have yet to hear my name called. What's your name? Elisa McGee. Elisa McGee. Okay, we only had one hour of public testimony, so not everybody uh, will be allowed to be heard today. Uh, you were up here earlier, so I'll give you 30 seconds, and that is it. We no, can't take it. I wasn't up here earlier. I heard okay. you say McGee, so I walked okay. up the ask, what was the name? Okay. You, you could speak for 30 seconds, and then... Thank you. Thank My you. name is Elisa McGee. that'll Mc... be it for public comment. Thank you. My name is Elisa McGee. I'm a resident of Vermont Knowles neighborhood. The county of Los Angeles has a penny of eminent domain. 90% of the residents do not want this county project. We asked the plumb consistents to stop this project. In the past years, decades of... We have several programs and promises made to, you, to, made to the South LA CDA Marquise Harris Dawson, Sir, such as community... Ma'am, hello. We... we the, you might have signed up for public comment. We are not on that topic. We haven't called public comment, general public comment. All right. That's, that's why we do not do this because of, oftentimes. Thank you very much. That concludes public comment. Not everybody who signed up today will, uh, can, we allotted one hour to speak. We've had a lot of public testimony on this today, so we're going to continue with our discussion at the committee level. And first, let me start off by saying that we hope to move something forward today to full council, uh, but it is not the end of the discussion. We actually uh, can possibly, uh, the, the housing committee will possibly hear this item, and then it needs to go back to the city planning commission and back to council again. Uh, I hope to move that as quickly as possible as I can of chair of this committee so that we could finally get an ordinance that makes sense. And again, when we first started this conversation, uh, we start this conversation through a motion that was made by a couple of council members who were aware that we do not have a regulatory system when it comes to short-term rentals as to other large cities, and we need to move forward with one. So as I've heard public testimony today, if for those of you who are suggesting that we have no regulations, that simply is not an option. We need to move forward with some regulation. And I think what we've developed is a fair and balanced one that protects our housing supply, that protects the quality of life for our neighborhoods, that allows uh, people to continue and supplement their income uh, where, they, uh, where they can at their current primary residence, and that does not punish current hosts who are good operators in the neighborhood. Uh, given what we've heard, uh, I'm proposing, and I'd like to lay out some uh, instructions to our planning department as a point of discussion so that when we could then raise questions uh, from that. And I'm asking the planning department to amend the proposed ordinance as follows. First, to have a 120-day citywide cap and to adopt the framework that allows qualified hosts to participate in home sharing above 120 days via an administrative approval process that includes neighbor notification to abutting property owners. Host must have had a home sharing permit registration for at least six months or have hosted for at least 60 days. Two strike verified citation policy from an enforcement agency of the city of Los Angeles, such as ACE, the Building and Safety, HCI DLA, and LAPD. Also, allow hosts to participate in home sharing above 120 days via a discretionary review process in the event that administrative approval is denied. Eliminate conversion by transient occupancy residential structures annual renewal for all home sharing permits by right, administrative, and discretionary. That includes those. Landlord opt-out provision, per night surcharge to help offset cost of enforcement and compliance. Enforcement enhancements to be included. 
such as 24-hour, seven days a week staffed hotline to receive complaints, real-time outreach to hosts to resolve issues, web-based registration renewal process, established task force for coordination between city agencies. We also would like to see in the platform agreement that will include actively remove listings that violate home sharing ordinance, designate an employee or representative to respond to enforcement issues and coordinate sharing of information, provide the city in an electronic format relevant information needed by city to conduct enforcement, and abide by regulations of transit occupancy tax ordinance. That's a motion I'd like to put out there as a point of discussion, seconded by Mr. Englander. And now to begin discussion, let me start with Mr. Uh, Price. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I do have a couple of questions if we could get the staff back up at the table. <clears throat> yes, sir. I'm sorry. I'm, okay. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Chair. First of all, thank you for, for your leadership on this uh, real um, difficult issue. You've been uh, sticking with it for many, many months now, along with other members of the committee, and I just appreciate uh, your stick to -itiveness. Also, the planning department should be congratulated for, uh, for your efforts. Uh, but I do have uh, a couple of questions on the, on the process that we've been uh, presented with. Uh, what constitutes a nuisance violation when an applicant is applying for the extended um, sh uh, process, the extended sharing process? What, what constitutes a nuisance? Ar Arthi Varma, Department of City Planning. A nuisance violation would be um, a variety of violations. It could be violations, a code enforcement citation by building and safety, for example, uh, for uh, parking in, on the front yard setback. Uh, it could be a citation by HCID for a violation of their code. It could also be an operational citation, usually a ticket uh, by LAPD for violation of the noise ordinance, an array of uh, tickets that are uh, cited through the ACE program mm -hmm, for mm -hmm. a variety of different um, operational So was the host violations. cited or the guest? Who cited? Uh, the ghost? The, 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 host the host would be cited. Okay. And the guests, uh, there's no... No liability? It would be the host and the property owner that would be cited. So yeah. both would be cited. I see. Um, what types of conditions can be imposed on applicant properties? What kinds of conditions can we impose? Arthi Varma, Department of City Planning. The conditions that could be impo imposed through the discretionary approval process could include uh, that uh, no, there could be no uh, commercial gatherings for events such as uh, wedding parties at uh, any outside areas be uh, not used after a certain hour. Uh, any conditions that can be imposed that would limit some of the nuisance, potential nuisance uh, issues that could arise. Uh, residency is an important uh, requirement uh, under uh, the proposal. What documentation, uh, if any, is the city going to require to prove residency? The residency requirement documentation could include uh, driver's license, utility bills. There's, there's a number of different documents that are typically used for primary residence verification, and that would be required as part of this process. Well, I would suggest that there be more than one, perhaps two or three, that would have to be presented. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, must applicants attempt administrative approval before discretionary approval, or can they apply directly for the discretionary track? Sorry, can you say that again? Yep. Must the applicants attempt the administrative approval process before they go to the discretionary, or can they begin with the discretionary? Arthi Varma, they could begin with the discretionary process if they have a, a, a complaint from a neighbor. Uh, for example, the, the, pr the framework that was set forth required the, uh, the applicant to not have any nuisance, verified nuisance violation. One of the options is a neighbor uh, sort of consent, if you will, notification sent out to the 100-foot radius, and if there's a complaint, the host would be ineligible for the administrative process and could go directly to the discretionary process. Uh, in other cases, if the applicant thinks that it's more efficient to go just directly to the discretionary, that's an option as well. Oh, there was an option. Okay, great. Last question. Um, so does the discretionary process allow for home sharing 
up to 600, I mean, 365 days? Uh, that's that's an option that the council could consider. The council could consider placing uh, a secondary cap as well. But as it's laid forth in the report, it is an, an up to uh, the 365 days per year. That's also a condition that could be placed through, as you asked earlier about what types of conditions could be placed, that could right. be something that's done on an individual basis as well. Okay. Well, I, I, uh, I, I support the, uh, the amendments that have been proposed by the chair. I think they've been very thoughtful and, and, and comprehensive. Uh, and while I appreciate the planning department's work to balance the various interests of, of all stakeholders, uh, I'm still a little concerned about this discretionary process that uh, doesn't cap the number of days uh, that uh, an applicant can request. <clears throat> I also want to emphasize the importance of meaningful enforcement. I think that's something we've all have talked about. The last thing our city needs is to have uh, bad actors taking advantage of the process, paying the fee, and, and continuing to put our long-term housing stock in jeopardy. Again, I'm not saying that uh, that is uh, something that everyone would do, but we just must be mindful of that. Uh, so I'm, I'm eager to see the CPC's recommendations on how we can ensure that this ordinance has some teeth uh, when it returns to, uh, returns to council. Uh, but I think this is a framework uh, that uh, will uh, permit us to move forward, uh, respecting the rights of, of businesses, of uh, entrepreneurs, and of our citizens. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Mr. England, do you have a follow-up? I, I, just, just a quick from Mr. Price. I want to, you can come back to me later. I've got some other questions as well. But for clarity, um, one of the things Councilmember Price spoke about was the citation um, process. What types of citations would this fall under? Um, and I think the, the chairman's motion actually said verified citations. But more importantly, um, or as importantly for clarification, what does that mean in terms of um, if somebody receives a citation for any of the number of issues, conditions, noise, nuisance, uh, parking, etc.? cetera? Um, that citation, which will either go to the homeowner or, uh, or the host, I should say. It could be a renter. The host or that address. We don't typically cite addresses for certain nu nuisances. We cite the individual, which would then be the person who is staying there um, or the shared housing tenant, if you will. So I think we need to put a little more thought into that process to make sure that ver violations are actually captured and what does that mean. And then if you can go further on that when you come back, once it's gone through CPC and spell that out, because this is a little more unique, how long does that violation last for? Is it a lifetime ban? Does it run with the property? What happens if the property is sold? If it's a renter that is renting out as an Airbnb? and they move out, what happens then? Because that is that a takings lawsuit? I mean, I know the devil's in the details, and this is getting a little more detailed than this conversation's gotten. But I think in terms of the enforcement element of it, or having an administrial approval for extended days, this piece is critically important. Um, and so if you could actually just uh, at least put some framework together of how that would work, because we're really basing this on citations then. And if we're doing that, I don't want this to be on a house of cards. Okay. And I can come back later with my questions. Thank you. Yes, Mr. harris -Dawson. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Chair. I just want to add to Mr. Englander's uh, comments. I think this will wrap it up for me for this session. Uh, it, in addition to this issue of citations, so there are other citations that I think are important. Some of the folks who gave testimony raised them today, certainly in District 8 we have this. So parking enforcement, right? So a big concern uh, in lots of the city is people parking on lawns, people blocking the sidewalk. Now again, the, the that's parking citations don't go to property owners, they go to the car. Uh, but it seems to me there's got to be a way to monitor that because if someone's renting out rooms in their house and they have a bunch of par cars parked on the lawn, residents ought to have some recourse. Also, uh, folks uh, in other parts of the city raised the whole issue of, of uh, people creating fire hazards because they're unfamiliar with the terrain or the neighborhood that they're in. And so it seems to me that the fire department should be 
uh, one of the agencies that we looked to see whether citations or recommendations were made uh, by the fire department to cut brush or to, you know, fix a, a, a broken uh, a broken window or, or whatever safety uh, recommendations or citations that the fire department might hand out ought to absolutely be a part of this, and we ought to figure out how to fold in at least parking enforcement as well. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Mr. Bloomingfield. Right, thank you. Um, appreciate it. Building off something that uh, um, uh, Harris Dawson just raised in terms of the safety standards. What are, what are some of the life safety standards that, um, let's say, you know, bed and breakfast or boutique hotels have to uh, use that uh, Airbnbs that may be doing 365 days a year don't have to do? Are there any? Matt Klesney, planning. Um, yeah, I believe that hotels are, 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 because their transient uses are held to a different building code standard, I believe that affects things like sprinklers uh, and door widths. Um, not sure I have all the details, but those are some of the things that may apply to hotels uh, when they change, when they're, when they're serving transient uses. They may not apply to a, a residential structure that is used primarily for long term, so it's not subject to those transient building codes. Um, I'll just know. But, but if it's being used at this point, if we're allowing it to be used 365 days a year, um, then it is being used for transient uses. So wouldn't there be some requirements that we would want for the extended stays that, that would relate to health and safety? Things like having a fire extinguisher in the kitchen, having a clearly marked exit sign. I mean, there, presumably there were reasons for some of these uh, health and safety rules that were put in place for you know, boutique hotels, some of which may be only a couple of rooms, you could theoretically have a, uh, an Airbnb with more rooms and more people coming through it than, than a hotel that has all these requirements. All right, Matt Kalesi, I was, to, your, to that point, I was going to point out that the ordinance currently does include some basic safety requirements, such as uh, providing and maintaining fire extinguishers, smoke detectors, carbon monoxide detectors, and information related to emergency exit routes and emergency contact information. Uh, so that's, that's what it is currently, but things like requiring the building to be sprinklered or fixing your door widths is not in there. We're certainly open to uh, counsel. Yeah, I mean, we don't want to put something that's unreasonable on, on homeowners, and I'm, I'm sensitive to that. I just want to make sure that if we are going this route where we're, we're allowing this extended use, that we're making sure we're also uh, taking the precautions for, for health and safety. Um, so maybe as as part of what you're looking at, you can look at those, what are the critical health and safety requirements that maybe should go along with extended and extended use. Maybe not for the by right 120, but you know, we're doing this bifurcated model. Uh, but maybe if you're going from 120 to 240 or 120 to 365, that there is a, a health and safety reason, both to protect the city as well as protecting the um, the visitors. Absolutely. We'll work with the building and safety department to see if they have any recommendations as we move forward on that. Thank you. Okay. And could you explain a little bit more about the neighborhood sign off issue? Uh, and I know that the chair is proposing something that would not do neighborhood sign off, but it was part of the planning commission. Your report back included the neighborhood sign off. How would that work exactly? Arthi Barma. So the proposed framework that was uh, presented in the report included a notice sent to neighbors, owners, and occupants within 100 feet and would allow them 15 days to send in any uh, comments or concerns with the activity. If there were comments received that uh, demonstrated concern, that host would not be eligible for the ministerial sign-off. One of the other options presented for the neighborhood um, notification would be simply a neighborhood notification. So again, it would be a notice to owners and occupants within the 100 feet, but it would be purely a notification. It would not require neighbors to send back any concerns had, if they had any. Now, after that permit is granted, if there are concerns that occur during the one year period of um, uh, eligibility of that uh, permit, they could rate, neighbors could call into the complaint hotline to register concerns that would then be captured during the renewal process. So if there were 
actual verified nuisance uh, complaint, nuisance activities that occurred, they would be ineligible for that uh, renewal. Uh, as an option, we could also look at uh, some of the complaints that came in during that one year period, uh, e even if they didn't lead to an actual citation or a verified <coughs> actual nuisance violation, that's something that we can look at, creating some sort of a process to capture the, the complaints that come in during that one year period. You know, my, my concern is um, if it's just a notification, to me, that's, that really doesn't, um, that's basically like having no cap at all. Because if, if all you need to do is notify, you know, the homeowners and the, and, or the, the neighbors, and they have absolutely no, no say in the matter other than being notified and they can make complaints, then effectively you've, you've lifted the cap and you've got a 365 day a year commercial operation in a residential zone and it's, it's allowed. So you, there's nothing to complain about unless there's a, a nuisance issue. Um, but I also understand the, the points that were raised about, well, you don't want to let one ornery neighbor or one racist neighbor or one somebody who holds some sort of a, a, a grievance uh, a veto somebody's ability to, to Airbnb. And I get that too. Uh, so I'm thinking maybe there is a middle ground here be there whereby you would not go so far, not be so liberal as to just say you're notifying folks but there's nothing you can do about it, but not being so strict that one neighbor has a, a veto. And maybe the proposal for that or what I would put forward as an option for this committee is to say if a majority of, majority of the neighbors within 100 feet or, or however you define it, affirmatively, you know, com affirmatively object to the Airbnb that's there, then they would not automatically get the 120-day extension. Uh, now, that's not an easy thing. For, for a majority of the neighbors to do anything uh, is, is uh, you know, you can't, if you wrote a majority of the neighbors a, a note saying, call this number and you get a check for 100 bucks, you might not get a majority of the neighbors to do that. So this is a pretty high hurdle, but I think it's a reasonable one. Uh, and I also think it goes to the question, you know, there is sort of a, a policy question here, which I know not all my colleagues agree, which is, which is, is an Airbnb, is it only a nuisance issue that should be what prevents somebody from uh, having an extended stay, or is there some sort of community um, community right, you know, where the, the community should have a say so whether they want a business running in their uh, in their area. And we do that with somebody has a doctor's office, you, you, you contact the community. There are other things I know, in fact, maybe you all can tell me about some other cities that do, uh, that have neighborhood sign off types of things. I believe San Francisco has something like that with general, maybe, let, maybe, let me start with a question about other cities that do these kind of neighborhood sign off things. Could you tell me about how that works in other places? Or Matt Glesney planning. Um, all we really do know about is the San Francisco model, uh, which you referenced, and my understanding of that uh, is that that is um, uh, certain thresholds of projects, major projects, get sort of sent out to a radius uh, of neighbors, and neighbors have the opportunity to proactively essentially fill out a, a application that says we are requesting, and there's a fee attached to that, um, we are proactively requesting this go under a discretionary review. An otherwise by right major project, any neighbor can bring that into a discretionary review then, then goes to their planning commission. So that's um, even more draconian than what I'm proposing, which right. is that's allowing one neighbor to make an objection that kicks it into the discretionary process. Um, what I'm suggesting, colleagues, is instead of just allowing one neighbor to kick it into a discretionary process, I would say if a majority of the neighbors object then you kick it into a discretionary process. And the underlying assumption there is that, you know, it may be about the citations or the noise complaints, but it may be just that that, that neighborhood uh, has enough other commercial enterprises going on and they, they, they don't want to have another commercial enterprise in, in their area. And I think when we, when we have, when we're allowing 365 days a year, that has a, a, a an impact on the community. It may not rise to the level of citation, but there's certainly a community impact. And by allowing the majority of the neighbors to, to kick it into this discretionary policy, I think that is something that would protect our communities and also be very reasonable and also, frankly, would hardly be used.
because it does take a lot to get to a majority. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna put that out there as, as a proposal uh, for this committee to include in there, in this. Um, you know, the other thing I, I wanna put out there regarding the complaints is I, I do think that we need to recommend that the notification to the neighbors, um, when there is a notification that's sent out, part of that notification outlines the complaint process and instructions on how to report a violation. It's very important that the notification not just be telling somebody what's happening, but, but clearly explaining how they can object, whether it's a button to click, where they get into a website, or a, a letter process, but it makes it easy and clear. Uh, so I would put it there, and, and as far as you know, my colleague Mr. Price had mentioned a, a cap on the far end too, I'm comfortable with that as well, as opposed to going to 365, having a, a 240 cap or some sort of number that's out there. Um, other questions I wanted to ask about, um, you know, just generally, going over the 120-day cap, does that incentivize short-term rentals over long-term rentals? Get your thoughts on that. Uh, sure. Planning, Matt Klesny. Um I think I think it's a case, it is a case by case situation. There are situations where a room may be available for a long term renter, but the the, uh, the homeowner has no interest in having a long term uh, operator. So um, in those cases, you're not really taking a housing option away from an Angelino because it would have never been used. But in, certainly, there are plenty of cases we can't quantify it. Uh, where a space, a guest house, a, a back home, uh, uh, livable suite could be an available s uh, place for a long-term renter or for a roommate, and um, that would be an option if not for the short-term rentals. I think the, some of the evidence in San Francisco is interesting that when the short-term rental, a, a large number of short-term rentals were removed from the market, the next week, next few weeks, uh, you saw a huge unprecedented spike in long-term rentals for rent uh, in the local uh, advertisements. Uh, Arthi Varma, I would just add in our uh, previous report back, we did report on that issue. Uh, we uh, discussed uh, two, two studies that had been done, one by Lane, one by Airbnb, that gave different numbers as to what that uh, break-even point was. Uh, the staff recommendation on the 120-day cap was based on that more conservative uh, break-even point. Also, in, in my request for the report back on the, on the life safety stuff, I also want to make sure we report back on what would require an inspection as well in terms of uh, reporting back versus, you know, on, on short-term homes versus hotels. Um, also, something I think we ought to include, regardless of, of where we land on this, is after a year to have a report back um, on the implementation of, of some of, of how this is working, like an implementation on the concentration and the number of, how, of nights rented, the effects on neighborhoods and the housing market, include the number of how many people have applied for uh, going above the 120-day cap, uh, yeah, include market. data to show that there's an over-concentration, whether there's an over-concentration in specific neighborhoods. Uh, so as part of this, I want to include that as something that we're putting forward, which is a report back after a year on these very important points because I think uh, when we land this plane we're going to want to know what those numbers are so that in a year from now we can we can look back you know I heard folks talking earlier saying everything's fine the way it is right now the short-term rentals are illegal in this city uh, I, I want us to legalize them and I want us to move forward so that people can use short-term rentals I believe in it I think it's a good thing uh, but I think we need to be smart about how, how we regulate it. So I just wanted to put that comment out there because I heard that theme in a lot of the folks who were very much for short-term rentals saying, don't touch everything, everything's fine. Well, right now, it's illegal. All the things you're talking about are not allowed in the city of LA. We're, what we're talking about today is how do we legalize it, how do we bring you out of the shadows uh, and make you legal and, and make this process work for everybody. So, I, and, I, and I'm very pleased with you know, the, the main things that are in this are this idea of primary residence, which I think we're all signed off on, uh, you know, and these are, these are the critical pieces to it. So, you know, I think that's it. I mean, in terms of the, the I have this issue with the, the 
I'd like to see some control with the neighborhood in terms of what kicks us into a discretionary process. I'm willing, I, I agree that, that allowing one neighbor to, to veto it is too much, but I do think that there is this room for uh, something that's less than that, but that's more than simply a notification, which to me is just, is just a, 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 false, a false cap. Uh, so that's, you know, Mr. Chair, I'd like to, to, I like all of your, I like most of your suggestions here. I would, I, I would like to amend it slightly uh, in terms of the, the allowing that, that slight difference in process to give the community a little bit more say. Um, and I think there was one other thing on your list, but I can't seem to find your, oh, the two, this is another point of clarification. The two-strike verified citation policy. I'm a little concerned. If somebody has a citation uh, under the planning, under your proposal, they don't get to go to the extended uh, to uh, over 120 days unless they clear that citation. Is that correct? Under the uh, framework that was presented, if you have a verified nuisance violation, uh, you would not be eligible for the extended home sharing for a period of three years. Okay, and, and Mr. Chair, you were saying a two-strike yeah. verified citation policy. Is that, um, I, I would like to know, I, I, I'm okay with the two-strike, but after the person has cleared up the strikes, I, I wouldn't want someone to advance to the extended if they still have um, a citation that has not been cleared. So that's the other amendment I'd like to, to make to Mr. Chair's uh, very good proposals, which is one, to make sure that if you have a citation, you have to clear it before you moved, you were accepted into the into the 120 day beyond. And the second has to do with the ability to have a majority of neighbors who are notified if they majority of them object that it kicks it into the uh, discretionary. Okay, Mr. Englander. So, so what I'd like to do is entertain. I think there were a number of good ideas that you'd brought up. Councilmember Blumenfield, and so what I'd like to do is ask the chair to actually incorporate those suggestions into a report back, so when it comes back from CPC and Council on the Plum, we can look at that and examine it. For example, I was looking at one of the things you had said about the notification process. It could be said, actually, um, from a different perspective, that under the proposed notification process from staff and the amendment made by the chair, that if nobody appeals at all the amendment process, it actually wouldn't even go to an administrative clearance. It would just be approved if there's no appeal, for example. Why go through the cost? So, so it could be said both ways, right? And streamlining the other end of it if there's no issues. Um, so I think that should be looked at and maybe those are the reports back if the chair um, is okay with that. What I would look at and I wanted to look at was um, why we're all here and really get to the heart of that. And that's where my specific questions are and my proposal is going to come from. Why we're here. So we've, we've been studying this ad nauseum for three years. Um, not only at the many public comments and, and committee hearings that we've had, but certainly out in our community. There's not a day that goes by, I think in the last three years that I know I'm not alone in my office where, and I'm sure every other office is the same, we get a phone call or an email or something on social media urging us to regulate the shared housing in our communities because of the impacts. Or another one that's soon followed up by the hosts that are urging us to keep it because they can't pay their rent. They all also get into a lot of details, very specific details about their personal life stories. And some of them are very heartfelt about how they would, would have been homeless or lost their home had they not had this opportunity of a platform for shared housing. Or how they can't allow their kids to play outside in the backyard, yet alone the front yard, because right next door is what's become not a shared housing but a party house of different people every single night. So we hear the extremes on both ends. So here we are coming up with rules and regulations for the balance of such. 
That's what really this is about. That's what it boils down to. So whatever we come up with, whether it's 84 days according to some of the studies or 120 days, or there's a process or a program for an administrative clearance to extend those beyond, or people have had violations that have been verified or not, at the end of the day, it's a balance of protecting the very people, the Angelinos, the residents who live here first, period. That's the most important. In fact, I was just meeting with a group of constituents in my office yesterday. I know Heather was here with some of her friends who she was on the microphone, in fact, moments ago testifying. And she's involved, as an example, in her neighborhood watch. And that struck a chord with me because neighborhood watch was a program that is international, an international program that was started not just here in the city of Los Angeles. It was actually started by one of my predecessors, Councilmember Hal Bernson, in my district. Um, and neighborhood watch means knowing who your neighbors are coming and going in the cars that are parked in front of your home. Um, this, this doesn't really allow that when we've had this kind of disruption. And, um, and so what we're really talking about is that balance. So to me, it's about enforcement. Councilmember Price mentioned if we pass something with no teeth, what's the point? And so I want to focus on the enforcement part of it for a moment. That's the most important component on the rules and the regulations is the enforcement component. Are we, get, are we, going, to ab are, are we going to be able to enforce the very rules that we're going to pass? I will tell you from my experience, both prior to being on the council, being a council member, being a police officer, that many of the rules and laws and ordinances that we pass today, we don't enforce. We can't enforce. They're unenforceable, or we simply don't have the staff and the resources to enforce. So that's my focus for a moment, the staff and the resources. What we're proposing here today, I believe, are pretty ironclad on enforcement. What I don't believe are that we're going to have the staff and the resources to do so. So that's part of it, and I want to ask for this to be included. The other part is the disruption in the communities. There's a massive disruption in every community. And it's not council specific and it's not geographically based. For example, I had during the holidays, three of my neighbors had parties almost every day where they had neighbors coming in, family coming in every day out of town. And it was odd that so many would have that much disruption. Um, and they were coming and it didn't matter that they were staying at a shared house and they were all, none of them were staying in hotels or motels, but none of them in my neighborhood, but they were all coming there every day and parking everywhere and we were getting the impacts every day also. It doesn't matter that it's not council specific because it could be right across the street. Our council offices, in fact, in council districts are, are weird boundaries that are cut up all over the place. So there's disruption everywhere. Um, with that, there's a lot of impacts, a lot of people that unfortunately come and stay here that aren't residents but are tourists or transient nature and tenants, don't have that same respect or pride of rentership or community or ownership. And so we all have those impacts. So with that, I want to make sure that we actually come back, when this comes back, with a real fee, fee study. A fee study and a schedule that includes the following, five fees. The TOT, which I'm going to come back to in a minute, that's being proposed in here. A daily surcharge that covers the full cost, the full cost recovery of violation enforcement, enforcement, follow-up, data collection, everything we need to do to make sure that we actually are putting the teeth into this and what that surcharge should be. I'd like to see an annual registration fee um, by the hosts, but again, not sticking it to the hosts as we've heard here, but getting them some buy-in, so something that's not prohibitive. Instead, what we should have to make up that difference is an annual platform fee for the platform to pay annually. Whether it's VRBO, Airbnb, HomeAway, there should be an annual registration to the city a platform fee, which other cities are doing as well. The fines and penalties, that structure should come back with 
either the ones we already have on the books or any new proposed ones because of this ordinance. And then lastly, and most important, is the expenditure plan. Where's the money going? If we're going to be collecting these, where are they going? The administrative oversight enforcement, which departments, where are they going? Do they need staff? What are their staffing requirements? That's critically important, important and part of the fee structure. And then lastly, and equally important, is because every community in the city is impacted by these. I think it, it's fair, we've done this in so many other places and spaces and regulations and rules and fees, that we take 10% of that TOT. 10% goes into uh, equally across the city for additional enforcement, for overtime, for things that the council office can call upon, for beautification, for graffiti and weed abatement, for things that have to go back to the very communities citywide, they're all being impacted. And we've done this again in other spaces and places and rules and regulations. That 10% of that TOT, that would be my motion, uh, that fee schedule come back and 10% of the TOT come back um, and carved out. Uh, and it could be akin to a GCP, for example, um, and divided equally across the city. But I want to make sure that this community, that every community receives, for example, each, every council office throughout the summer spends money out of their own discretionary funds for additional party cars for LAPD because we see it ramp up and we didn't fund for it. That's a great example, party car. Things that we can have additional deployment. We can pay building and safety on overtime to go out on a weekend because they don't work weekends, but that's when we're getting the biggest spike in, sh in the shared economy, so we need officers there. So this 10% would cover those things. The most important thing we need to do is to protect our communities and our residents. So I would ask for uh, your support on that amendment. Okay. okay, any of the questions or comments on this? All right, so if we could, um, there are requests for a number of report backs. So we want to incorporate those into the record and those will actually be bifurcated from the actual ordinance that we're moving forward and re uh, the draft ordinance. We'll keep the report backs in committee because we want those to be reported back. Uh, although Mr. Bloomfield had one that you want a year back, uh, an annual report back on some items that you suggested, right? So we there was one for an annual report back yeah. to to get a variety of um, information about the implementation concentration of nights. I went through the list, but uh, yeah, we could accept that as part of the report moving forward. Um, the other report backs. We'll uh, bifurcate and keep it committee. There was one motion that, uh, and then Mr. Um, Englander raised a number of, uh, he, he gets the fees and report, that's all report backs, but the one motion that he asks on the expenditure that's already incorporated, it's just how we're going to spend the money once we get it, 10% to a GCP type. We'll include that in the ordinance, uh, uh, that motion. Um, Yes, Mr. Um, Bloomfield. The two, there, I had two, two items that I had mentioned that I were, was hoping would not just be report backs, but would be uh, policy options for us to have as we, as we are asking for these policy options. You know, one was the, uh, the option of, of uh, allowing, as, as the planning had already put forward, the idea of, of a neighborhood consent, but, but make, watering that down a little bit and just saying we would have, if a majority of the neighbors uh, formally objected, then that would allow for a discretionary process to, to make that something that, that we could uh, move forward to, to council and potentially vote on if okay. council wanted. Well, well let's, uh, let's do this. If you could make that as a motion to amend the main motion, and we could vote on that. Okay. Okay. That's one that's on the floor. And the other one was? Uh, the other one, which I thought was more minor, was the, the citation issue, which was... Uh, under the way it's written now, it says two strikes verified citation. And I would hope that um, before you would move, allow someone to move to the uh, administrative clearance, they would have to clear any citation that they have. Okay. You still have a two citation rule in terms of yeah. if you've got two, then you can't, you can't move forward. But if you, if you had one, you had to clear it before we move forward. 
Yeah, let's let's accept that. I don't, I don't think that would, um, if anybody objects to accepting your second one, we wouldn't make that as a motion. We'll accept that. Okay, great. Um, and so then the only outstanding thing is your motion on the 100 foot majority um, uh, of residents. So let's let's take a vote on that item. Well, first you need a second for that. So let's um, ask for a second on your amendment. There is no second on that yeah. amendment. So we will uh, not vote on that item. Right. Uh, but your citation suggestion, we'll incorporate that into the main motion to amend the draft ordinance. Okay. And, and Any sorry, other questions one, or comments? There was yeah. one other one which I, I mentioned I thought was also very minor, which was the recommendation that the notification going when you go above 120 days clearly outlined the complaint process and instructions on how to report a violation. I think that was assumed, but I wanted to make that clear. Yeah, we, we can incorporate that. We'll incorporate that. Also, Mr. Harris Dawson suggested that we include the fire department in our uh, two strike verification. Um, correct. And, and, and okay, we'll include the fire department in that place. We could amend the uh, motion so mr. Mejia yes sir what do we have uh, you have the uh, motion with the um, uh, instructions to amend the proposed ordinance uh, I don't know if you want to go no I went over that already went over that yeah you have uh, mr. Blumenfield's amendment um, on uh, the citation clearance and the report yes. back but not the majority of neighbors uh, directive. That no, didn't go through. That didn't, that didn't have a second, so okay. we're not discussing and that. And then uh, we have Mr. Englander's series of uh, instructions on enforcement and daily surcharges, annual registration fee, and expenditure plan, uh, the uh, TOT 10%, and basically having a system akin to the GCP process and whatnot. Uh, since those are very much uh, uh, issues that involve monies, perhaps you may want to ask the CAO to assist the planning department. Yeah, all those are our report backs and yeah. ask the CAO, but we are incorporating the expenditure plan of the totality uh, to create a uh, GCP type yes. expenditure for local council offices to improve the local community. I'll, I'll give you clarity on it. So or I'll just give it to you now. So just to simplify it, because I hadn't really thought about it through until I was talking about where it would go and to make sure communities are protected. Um, for simplicity, to say it would be 10% of TOT what's collected um, to go, uh, to be divided equally citywide into GCP, just to simplify it. That's so why the easiest way to... It would be akin to the GCP. Yeah. Okay. And, That's and it. If we could instruct CAO to assist the planning department, that would be great. And that would be part of the policy. Yes. Right? And we're adding the fire department to the two-strike verification. Yes. Got it? So yes. we're motion as proposed by the, ch the chair with uh, Blumenfield's uh, correction on the, um, on the um, citation that has to be um, completed, right? Or, or cleared. 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 It has to be cleared before you cleared. If you, to advance in the administrative clearance process. Exactly. If you have one strike against you. And then uh, Mr. Englander's 10% uh, of the expenditures to local communities, as it's described. 10% of collected, not collected, expected. collected, collected from TOT. And uh, Mr. S. Dawson had uh, correction to add the fire department uh, to the two-strike verification review. In, in addition to Mr. Englander's daily surcharge. No, that that is a report back. That's a report back. All that okay. other stuff is report okay. backs. Very so good. I just want to make sure that we all know what we're voting on. Okay. okay. Got it. Got it. All right, so we got that. I repeat it once more. Uh, the chair made it, uh, some amendments to the draft ordinance. We are incorporating a amendment to uh, have it be a citation that has been cleared. We're adding the fire department uh, to the two strike verification. We are adding on the uh, expenditure, the 10% uh, uh, expenditure to local communities as described by Mr. Englander. So those are the amendments we're making to the main motion. Okay. All right, is there any objections to that? No objections, okay, so ordered. Thank you, thank you very much.
Thank you all for coming. That concludes this item, and uh, this is not going to full council. Uh, the housing committee is also going to take this up uh, before it gets to full council. So thank you very much. We are now going to um, turn to general public comment. On the general public comment, we have Lori Sire, Craig Blaine, Mary Williams. Yeah. Lori Sire. Okay. Anybody here for general public comment? Okay, if you could come up, please, and state your name. What is your name? If we could ask everybody as they're making their way out, shh, we're still in committee. Shh, just, if you can, keep it down, please. Thank you, Mr. Englander. What is your name? Barbie Molina. Okay, go right ahead. Hello, everybody. I would like to express that I am a homeowner in Porter Ranch. My husband and I used to own a restaurant called De Cachet Restaurant. Many of you were actually there. We were put out of business. It's been hard. We had to reinvent ourselves. As we speak, I only make $67,000 a year. We were negative $5,000 last year on our taxes. We're barely making it. We cannot afford to rent the house in Porter Ranch, who has a bad reputation. And as you know, we cannot sell and we cannot even get top dollar for that house. We have a large mortgage to, to cover. I need you all to understand, we're not making money, we're helping the community. We send our people every time to restaurants, even to hotels, to the bars. We support hotels as well. We love hotels, but you know what? Not all of us can afford a hotel. And I appreciate you guys considering homeowners as ourselves. Thank you. Great, thank you. What's your name, please? Margaret Malloy. Thank you. Welcome. Hi. So I was saying there's a 23% increase in homelessness across LA County from 2016 to 2017, staggering 75% surge in the last six years. The correlation with short-term rental explosion is obvious. Southern California has always been a desired travel destination. That's a given. But it's the responsibility of our city leadership to put a higher priority on the protection of residents, the protection of our limited rental housing stock, and the integrity of our communities over short-term pro profits for a few. Invariably, lo lower or earning residents are displaced first. These are our service providers at all levels. The feasibility of living and working within a reasonable commuting distance affects quality of life of all workers and renters. It also has an environmental impact. The earth is melting, we know this. Displacement of workers and service communities has a negative accumulative environmental effect on our city. It is obvious that we should implement the strictest possible ordinance Thank to start. It is easier to expand privileges and legislation than to contract them later. I know you know this. Help us. <laughs> Thank you. Anybody else here on public comment, general public comment? What's your name? Did you sign up? I have here Lori Sire, Craig Blaine, Mary Williams, Maricati Seismer, Deborah Growing, Alisa McGee. Yeah. Welcome. You may speak. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. My respect for all your passion and your love for the job you're doing. Uh, my name is um, Georgina Serrano. I'm a community organizer with Inquilinos Unidos now. I work in this community uh, 12 years ago. Now I return and work uh, with, with this organization. So i observing the area and I'm talking about the item 17-12-72. So the tallest building in the area is uh, 14 stories high, and the project that is planning to build it there is 40-something um, stories high. 
And my worry, as your roots, Mr. Um, Wizard, is for the schools is four feet from the project. And if the owner of this new project want to put uh, alcohol consumption on the, on the new uh, building, um, have to respect the 14,000 feet rule. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Lisa McGee. Thank you, and I do apologize for earlier. This is my first time here. So um, my name is Elisa McGee. I am a resident of Vermont Knowles neighborhood. The county of Los Angeles has a, a pending case of eminent domain. 90% of the residents do not want the county's project. We asked Plun to assist us in stopping this project. In the past years and decades, we've had several programs and promises made to us here in South LA, CD8, such as these two programs, the Community Redevelopment Act, CRA, or C Cities declared a neighborhood blight would use a portion of property tax to collect to help. However, this program ended in failure. CRA LA ruined South LA during a 20-year span without building any projects, blocking economic development that would have brought tax revenue to urban communities. Examples of properties, the 22-acre Marlton Square development, B, Slauson and Central, C, 4.5 acres on Vermont and Manchester D, Broadway and Manchester, a rebuilt LA was born in 1992. The board was comprised of 92 fortunate 100 entrepreneurs, community leaders, and public officials. Prior to the uprising, government had held, had held the failure to deliver the people of South LA, CDA. This program ended in failure in 1997, and that was the um, rebuilt LA after the riots. So we have two different programs Thank that you. failed the community in CDA, and we would Thank like you. some type of recognition on moving forward for economic development to have balance, just like everybody in here been asking for. Thank we you. would like balance, and I have documents to hand to the committee. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker, please. Buenas tardes. ¿Cómo se llama? Uh, Teresa Altamirano. Ok. Me va a hablar el asunto de 17.12.72. Uh, un momento, ahorita la va a traducir esta persona aquí. Gracias. Ok. Buenas tardes, mi nombre es Teresa Altamirano. Good afternoon, my name is Teresa Altamirano. Vengo representando Inquilinos Unidos. I am representing Inquilinos Unidos. De MacArthur Park. En MacArthur Park. Mi preocupación es por los edificios viejos que van a tirar. Uh, my worry right now is about the old buildings that they are going to be taken down. Por ese proyecto que están haciendo. Because of the projects that you are trying to build. Y mi preocupación es por la salud de, lo, de nuestros niños. Uh, my worry is the health of my children. Uh, por el plomo. The plum. Mojo. El mo. Uh, mo. mo. Los ar arbusto. Y quisiera pues pedirles a ustedes I would si like el, to ask you guys si el desarrollista pensó en la salud de nuestros niños. If the builder thought about the sales of our children. Porque todo eso le va a hacer le va a perjudicar la salud de nuestros niños. Because all of these things are going to uh, hurt the, the health of our children. Igual así como de las personas mayores también, que ya son mayores de la tercera edad. Also, it's going to be a problem for, the, for the people of the third age. Que también todo eso le va a perjudicar a, a nuestros niños y a las personas de la tercera edad. This is going to hurt our children and, uh, and seniors as well. Por el mo. Because of the mo. Por la, todo eso, todo eso, este, el... Plomo, perdón. Sorry. Gracias. That's it. Thank you Gracias. so much. Gracias. Next speaker. You may want to come back. Um, interpreter. ¿Cómo se llama? Mi nombre es Rosita López y vengo representando. My name is Rosita López and I'm representing. Uh, Inquilinos Unidos. Inquilinos Unidos. Y, y al Concilio MacArthur Park. And MacArthur Park uh, Council. Y voy a hablar del asunto número 17-12-72. So I'm going to talk about the uh, item number 17-12-72. Y, 
and the trucks that are going to be bringing all the material for the construction. There is going to be 6,429 trips. And they, these trips are going to affect one, the 101 freeway, 170 and freeway 5. This, uh, this, this transportation uh, trucks are going to be bringing material from Silmar to MacArthur Park. And this is going to cause a lot of problems with traffic. That's the reason why I'm asking for a study, a very comprehensive study to be done. This is going to affect me and my community. Thank you so much. Gracias. Uh, good evening. My name is Eduardo Aguirre. It's my third time here. I come here for the same issue as the time before. Uh, I'm going to talk about the construction of the building named Lake on Wilshire. Uh, this is going to affect me directly because I live in the next building on MacArthur Park apartment is the name where I live. The pollution will be hate. The lady talking about a lot, many people is talking about the same. Uh, you don't live there, you don't know the way we live. And uh, you have to think about the amount of pollution, the uh, 10 feet or 10 floors <coughs> uh, structure for parking lots will cause to our family. I'm here to make a quote and left a record uh, what we are talking about when these kind of issues come and, and the health against our kids, uh, someone have to answer for that and I wish all of you will answer for that to us. Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Okay, voy a hablar del asunto 17 12 72. I'm going to be talking about issue 17 12 72. Mi nombre es José Félix Cabrera. My name is Jose Félix Cabrera. Soy voluntario de la Inquilinos Unidos y uh, presidente de MacArthur Park. I'm an organizer for Inquilinos Unidos and a resident of MacArthur Park. El 95% de los residentes de MacArthur Park tienen un salario promedio de 26,700 dólares. Uh, 95% of the residents of MacArthur Park has a salary of about 26,700. La mayoría del, de la población en este barrio nunca podría vivir en este edificio. The great majority of the population in that, in that neighborhood could never live in that building. La comunidad exigimos por lo menos 100 viviendas de muy bajo costo para familias del área más desprotegidos. Uh, the community is demanding right now that at least a hundred of those uh, housing are distributed to the very low, uh, very low cost families that live in the community. Y queremos financiamiento para la educación y representación de los inquilinos del área que serán impactados con el proyecto. And we want financial for an education for the, um, all the inquilinos, all the renters that are living in the area that are going to be impacted by this project. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Gracias. That concludes our public comment period. Uh, that uh, concludes our meeting as well. Meeting adjourned. Thank you.